we decided uh, to use the World Water Week as a vehicle one time a year to look into how we are doing on SDG and the Paris Agreement, the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. So this is the fourth year we are now into this sub subject and I'm glad to have you here this morning. And right now, as often maybe, we are in between. We had a high-level political forum in New York this summer looking into some of the SDGs. There will be a UN Climate Summit coming up on the 23rd of September in New York. There will be an SDG Summit, etc. And we have the COP coming up in Chile. And there is also a process going on led by our colleagues from the Dutch government setting up the Global Center for Adaptation, the Global Commission on Adaptation. I think we've heard more about that this morning. That also will table report and also call for a summit next year. So there is momentum now. And I think what we can do is to bring in from our session today, but also what we do not only in session about the water aspects of tackling or mitigating, adapting to climate change, but also to fulfill the SDGs as we often uh, claim dealing with water, that water connects, or I, I think I quoted uh, Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, who was here last year uh, in the opening session, that water is the docking station for all SDGs. So there we have a lot of possibilities to, to, uh, to uh, make an impact, definitely. Now, uh, we also another process that we started uh, two years ago that we issued starting point with colleagues and friends and international organizations here at Stockholm World Water Week, an open letter addressing the main issues that we thought at that time to the member states of the General Assembly. And that was co-signed by 26 organizations to address these issues to the General Assembly, but also to fit into other uh, processes internationally and we have always ongoing the climate change discussions of course that are also not now taking track of where we are on the, on the uh, SDGs. So I think that is also an opportunity for us also to feed into those discussions from our community dealing more specifically with water. Uh, I understand also that there will be and maybe some of our colleagues who are doing this on a daily basis will come back to us about uh, a in coloration or in part of the Global Commission and Global Center of Adaptations work also announced a, uh, a water track in New York uh, in end of September. I think that is also a fantastic possibility for us as a community also to have the uh, issue of water addressed at the highest decision maker level. This high level dialogue today strives to identify some key areas when it comes to coherence, collaboration, efficiency, effectiveness relating to water-wise policies by taking next step some future-oriented solutions and programs to build a resilient future through water. And we in our institute, we are together with you also working broad in the scope more and more today work with not only governments, I just came from a business session this morning, 60 people turned up for business, a breakfast we had. We also work much more with city and city leaders. And I think if I look around the world where I see the maybe driving force nowadays on climate and SDGs, etc., or at least most inspiring uh, uh, actions to be taken, it's often among city leaders and also business leaders. So I think this is a good opportunity for us also to gather from different walks of life in this session, from uh, public, civil society, business, also city or local leaders. Uh, so that is also a fantastic possibility. So there we bring together uh, actors from many different areas uh, here today to influence the global agenda processes, but also relating back to what we do on, uh, in our local communities. I think this linkage is so important that it's not only what we discuss at the global level, it starts and ends what is done on the local level. That is for sure whatever we are doing on water or climate. At the same time, of course, we know there is not uh, a, a quick fix. It's not anything that we can make use of for any aspect that we do deal with. It's not a, a, a panacea. We need also, of course, to look into different um, conflicts or possibilities that there are might different views, etc., how to tackle it. I think that is also 
still uh, so important that they meet in sessions or in venues or in or conferences like this. I often ask my staff, will there be physical conferences in the future? I mean, we can follow maybe online, we can follow also through uh, apps, etc. nowadays. But still, I think we need, we should meet and we need to meet to find solutions together. And that is also fantastic to have you all here today to have this possibility to discuss and come forward with ideas how to uh, make us a more water-wise world, which is the vision from CV. So I think with those few words I should start kick off this session and uh, I would like now to invite Maggie White, Senior Manager International Policy at CV to take us to the next uh, part of this first part of the session because we have uh, I guess round at 10.30 then we will break intermission and then come back at 11. But Maggie you can tell us more where we are. So once again most welcome to this session. And I'm glad to have this room filled up with all of you. Maggie. Thank you. I'm innovating, so I'm not going up on the stage. That's special high level people up there. <laughs> no, but I want to say thank you to all um, for being here. We like to innovate at Siwi. And innovation is not just about technological in innovation. It's also about mindset. How do we innovate in our mindset? How do we bring behavioral change? Uh, how do we think differently and act differently? And I think that's the big stake we have today when we're looking at the global agendas. How do we move forward and how do we implement in the most efficient way? So we really have to change the way we think, the way we work together. We have to stop doing business as usual and try and figure out solutions together. So that's why we want you to share all um, your insights, your input, learn from each other. Uh, CUE is a water institute, uh, so it's about brokering, uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, so I'm very happy to see that you have all agreed to this a bit unfamiliar, maybe for some a bit uncomfortable format. Uh, um, I heard a lot of positive things about the opening uh, um, that we had, and we really tried to do things differently, bring a different flavor, a different touch to show that things can be done differently. So thank you to all our prominent representatives of uh, governments, of UN agencies, uh, also of basin organizations, uh, the private sector, um, um, uh, funds also multilateral banks. You're all in this room because you all have something to share with us. So of course we have some experts in the fishbowl that will kick off a few elements, but you are all invited all around this table, uh, around this room, to step in also at one point. Uh, but that will be the second part of the, the today. Uh, we first have Two keynote speakers, um, still trying to be a bit traditional. We're not going to change everything right away. Yeah. Um, so we're very happy to have a framework that will be set for us. And then Mathilde Bouilly, who is here, will take us into the fishbowl discussion. But I really invite you all to come in, to engage, to discuss, to share your thoughts, to provoke a bit also, uh, just to make those lines move um, a little bit. Because when we talk about water for society, including all, we are all part of that solution and we really need to work all together. But first of all, um, we're very honored to be able to welcome the ambassador in Sweden to Chile, Hernan Baskunian. Um, he will deliver a keynote about the upcoming um, COP that's taking place. Uh, and here again, um, when I was in New York at the HLPF, SDG 13 was being reviewed and uh, the minister, uh, Karina Schmidt, uh, who is ensuring the presidency, called it not only a blue cop, uh, very important for her, but she also said that we have to address adaptation and mitigation together. We cannot have those separate. They really have to be addressed when we are implementing our programs. And that's how we're going to be more efficient in the way we move forward also. And Chile has also been saying that they want this to be a multi-stakeholder COP. It's not just the countries coming together. They want the private sector to be there. They want civil society organizations to be there. They want the academics to be there because we cannot find the solutions in isolated ways also. So we salute um, Chile for their vision in that. And we would love to hear more from you, Ambassador. Please join us on stage. Thank you. For Can you hear me? It's, it's fine. Yeah, I guess, I'm Maggie, you read my speech, actually. <laughs> you took some note. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, 
Chile assumes the presidency of COP25 in our conviction that climate change is a collective task that must be resolved not only with the participation of the parties of the convention, but also with the cooperation of private sector, civil society, the scientific community and academia. COP25 will be held in Santiago, as you know, between the 2nd and the, 20th, and the 13th of December this year. Uh, this conference marks the end of a long process to agree on the rules and guidelines for the Paris Agreement, but at the same time it is the departure point of a new phase. A new phase more oriented toward concrete action and policy implementation. We are in a crucial, mom crucial moment where countries should make additional effort to increase ambition to avoid the consequences of climate change in the future, identify cooperation, and to boost a greater mitigation of emissions. The need to promote higher level of ambition comes from scientific evidence. As you know, the trajectory is shown by the IPCC in the report revealed that emission reduction must be drastic and pronounced, and that the success of the Paris Agreement will likely be determined by mitigation of effort in the next decade. Adaptation to climate change has been identified as a priority for Chile. Our high vulnerability, sorry, it's a word that I can never pronounce, and the increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events have generated an even greater demand for resources to make large investments that strength the ability to adapt to their effect. Chile is currently suffering a decade-long drought. I have seen the pictures on the newspaper on, on the Chilean TV and it's really, really, I think that we will have a very non-easy situation this, during this year because it's, we, we are in our rainy season and it's no rain, it's a very little rain. So we will have problems in the, in the in the future, now in the in this in this summer, you know, uh, we have also uh, some some floods and large large uh, scale wildfires. We have floods in the south, in the in the north of Chile. Sometimes when, when we never had before, and now we have in the in the in the, in the part of the in, in the limit with Peru and Bolivia. Also, we have torrential rains in some places that we were not used before, and hailstorms. Uh, these are really affecting our uh, our de development capabilities because they affect our economy. Uh, water is a relevant element that the Chilean presidency has identified in the cross-cutting theme from the conference, and not only because of the roles of, of oceans and cryosphere as key elements as regulator against climate change. Water management, it is also very important in climate action related to circular economy and the implementation of initiative of mitigation and adaptation. Ch Chile is committed with, with this effort and COP25 is a great opportunity to share ideas and showcase concrete measures against climate change and its devastated, devastating consequences. This calls also respond to the urgency of creating conditions for sustainable economic growth and the promotion of new paradigm towards sustainable production and consumption patterns. For this reason, COP25 also aims to achieve long-term strategies and the projection of instruments within the United Nations system, which consider the participation of non-state actors such as the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, as you mentioned before. In this important mechanism of participation for non-state actors, water is one of the seven themes in which climate action is needed and its natural dimension, but also in the creation of sustainable infrastructure. The organization of COP25 is a country effort, assumed by Chile and to which we invite all interested actors to collaborate. As you remember, it was a very last-minute decision because we have had very few, few time to organize this, this, this COP, but I guess that things will, are going well and they are quite well organized and you will see at the result that will be good. So I hope that it will be like that. Uh, in this process, urgent and profound transformation are required through process 
that benefit our communities, and we want to make a call for more ambitious commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emission and implement concrete policies to adapt to the consequences of climate change. We hope that in Chile in December, we can agree on concrete steps that take us a little closer to a future that is safe for the next generation. We don't have time to lose, it is time for action. So I hope that in COP25 we will advance in this matter and we will try to find some solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so something very interesting happened this summer. In June, I was invited to, um, to be part of an international preparatory committee for an upcoming um, summit, the Budapest Water Summit. Um, and in that discussion, we were talking about the blockages that within the water sector, things are very divided and it's very difficult at the national level also for countries to be able to implement an integrated way here. Yeah. And saying how difficult it is for different ministers to talk to each other, the water ministry, the climate ministry, um, the resource management, environment. Um, and so yeah, it's too difficult to change. And then a month later, I got a call from India. So in July, well, Water Week is in August, uh, saying we have a wonderful story to tell. I was like, oh, really? What's happening in India? He's like, Modi has created a big ministry for water. He wants to tackle all the issues in one go, and that's reported directly to him. I'm like, really? Is that possible? Uh, are you able to bring such change? He's like, yes, and we're going to do it. Uh, I'm like, well, that's fantastic. I want to hear that story. So here we are, um, when I talk to him about innovation, changing the mindset, doing things differently. India is doing it. So I'm very honored to welcome uh, the representative uh, Mr. Gajendra Singh Sakawat, who is the minister of this Jal Sakti ministry in the government of India. Please come and share the story with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And hope every one of us have realized the power of water. If a lady becomes a queen or designated as a queen, it doesn't matter, it sounds common. But if a lady designated as a king, as a king of the world of waters, then it sounds. The lady Jackie King has been chosen uh, by the CV for, uh, uh, chosen as a king of the world of waters for this year. I must compliment and congratulate her. Thank you. Dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, Stockholm, water, uh, Stockholm laureates, delegates, water professionals, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the Swedish government and Stockholm International Water Institute for inviting me at the Water Week in this beautiful city and for extending their best hospitality to me and my team. I would also like to place my special gratitude to His Majesty King Carl for inviting me to the Grand Royal Bankway and I have another reason to thank His Majesty for sparing time to visit our Namami Gange stand along with the, the princes in the exhibition here and spending quite some time and showing keen interest. I'm here from the world's largest democracy to this beautiful country with, the, with one of the largest voter turnout in the world. I stand before you as an Indian and state with humility that Honorable Prime Minister have taken a le leading massive mission. The mission is for transforming our country as a new India. But simultaneously I affirm that this transformation cannot ha be achieved until we secure ourselves for water. This will be the time test for Indian ingenuity and innovation. It will be test of our talents to the hill and we are sure that we will be able to achieve the objectives of the mission. Our confidence stems us from the wisdom imparted to us by our forefathers. 
numerous shlokas from our Vedas and other holy books have sung about water, about the universe and about the environment. Here I would like to recite a particularly relevant one. Namostute panchatan matra panch mahabhute pratvi jal teja vayu akash shukshma devate. The shloka signifies that universe is made up of five elements, earth, water, fire, wind and space. And our body is also made up of the same. Thus we must respect them. And also we say, Aham Brahmasmi. Means we are the universe. So as we are the creator and simultaneously responsible for that. Our action, ancient wisdoms, is what derives my political leadership and it is clearly evident by the remarks of Prime Minister Modi at Paris Climate Change Summit where he said, we are guided by our ancient belief that people and planet are inseparable, that human well-being and nature is individable. Stockholm Water Week and is an instrumental force that shall shape future policies, thus our conglomeration today is, atmo is of utmost importance. We together can change the destiny of the world and this platform is where great ideas to save wor world shall emerge. Water has been the driving force behind every great civilization. Nations with abundance of water resources have achieved great glories and kingdoms have fallen in its absence. Water management and conservation today is more critical for global harmony than ever before. According to United Nations, 844 million people in the world have, are living without access to clean water. And 80% of the wastewater goes into waterways without adequate treatment. These challenges are putting pressure, which are new and pose fresh challenges for its use and management. Adequate financial and human resources, along with institutional and legal government uh, legal framework, Will, le uh, will largely determine as how we will cope up with these new challenges. The Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, has now put India's water security at the center of our government's development agenda. The first step, which was stated by the Master of Ceremony, that, the, that uh, we have constituted a new integral ministry to deal with all the aspects of water the Ministry of Jal Shakti <coughs> and I have had the privilege to be appointed as the first minister of that integrated ministry. The Ministry of Jal Shakti runs on philosophy that both the United Nations and Stockholm Water Week espouse while the theme of this event is water for all and the theme of UN Water Reports 2019 is leaving no one behind. Our philosophy is Jal Antyodaya. The philosophy of Antyodaya means enriching the experience of life and uplifting human dignity of the last to the last person on the line. Armed with the philosophy, we have planned to make safe drinking water accessible to every household through pipes in my country by 2024. And when I say about every household, it means that 250 million remaining household from the 180 million millions are to be facilitated facilitated thus i hereby invite the best brains in the world working in the sector of waters water management to be the part of this historic initiative to achieve all this i would like to cite the power of political leadership during the past and current times lal Bahadur shastri was india's second prime minister when India was facing a huge problem of food, food availability, we gave, he gave a call to the people of India where he said, fast once a week so the other can have meal. The, in, the people of India obeyed and soon millions of empathic, uh, empathized with the clarion call for the food security. In the next decades, India created world's biggest green revolution in agriculture, operation floods in dairy products produces, and India emerged as the highest producer of many same it, uh, of uh, agriculture and dairy. Today, 
the Prime Minister Modi it not, is at the forefront such a revolution to bring water security for the nation. Right from the highest office of, in the country on August 15 during the first Independence Day speech in the second tenure, Prime Minister Modi announced the Jal Shakti mission which plans to pipe uh, supply water to all households by 2024. This is an extremely ambitious goal as we all are we <coughs> as only about 18 percent of the rural household have piped water presently and approximately 145 million households are yet to be connected. The SDG goals set the deadline for this this feat at 2030 but we have set our own deadlines for year 2024. The Jal Jeevan mission will be focused on decentralizing water supply with the community taking the lead in the management of village level scheme and will have mandatory components of source sustainability, grey water recycle and reuse and water conservation in built, uh, in built in each scheme. The mission has been backed by an uh, earmarked budget of around US dollars 18 billion this year, uh, 48 billions this year. This mission will, be, uh, will contribute immensely to the global. Achievement of SDG 6 just like the sanitation mission named the Swachh Bharat mission did during the, la uh, the first term of Prime Minister Modi's government in last year. India's sanitation coverage has increased from 39% to 99% and India is now on the verge of becoming open defecation free. And over 550 million people have, ch have stopped defecating in, o in the open in the last five years alone. This astronomical feat has been achieved by making sanitation a people's movement, an unprecedented social uh, revolution. A similar revolution will be attempted for drinking water. India is also contributing to SDG 6 by working towards improvement, uh, improving water use efficiency and ensuring sustainable withdrawals. The Prime Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana per drop more crop implement <coughs> <coughs> implemented a nationwide program for increasing access to water for irrigation and using water judiciously with expanding coverage of micro irrigation. Our national aquifer ma mapping program is the largest program in the world of its kind and we such as formulation of aquifer aquifers management plans to facilitate sustainable development of groundwater an important aquifer system in the country. So far over a million square kilometer have been mapped and another 1.5 million be, will be mapped in the near future. Before I move forward, I would like to, thank you, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Cheki King for having the, the Stockholm Water Prize 2019. I would like to inform her, those on the dais and the di distinguished delegates that we have made our philosophy Healthy river ecosystem is not a luxury, but the basis of sustainable development, the core cornerstone of our water policies. One of the most ambitious river rejuvenation scheme in the world has been taken up by my government in a mission mode. The Namami Gange mission aims at rejuvenation of River Ganga and its tributaries following a complete river basin approach. The basin serves 40% of Indian population the result of such massive exercise could be seen during the last and largest congregation of humanity in the world, the Kumbh Mela, where the improvement in the water quality and river flow was observed by 200 million people. Here I would like to invite Dr. Jackie King to come to India. My government would like to utilize her expertise, knowledge and her, li her lifelong passion in furthering the cause of healthy river ecosystem. Further, the experience earned through this mission and having learned from the other river programs around the world, we have planned to revive all the major river basins in the country. All the above mentioned programs would fall flat on the face of people's participation. is not become an integral part of our water conservation efforts as achieving water security is not the sole responsibility of the governments. The people will also have to work towards a water resilient future for them. The Prime Minister, Minister has called a national movement on water conservation, especially to capture 
the rain water that India is blessed with. This mission called the Jal Shakti Abhiyan. This is a collaborative effort of the federal and state governments <coughs> to accelerate progress on water conservation activities in the most water stressed blocks and districts of India. Under this campaign, over a thousand senior officers have joined the states to promote focused intervention and creating rainwater harvesting, conservation and groundwater recharge, including restoration and renovation of traditional water bodies with the assistance of technology. A people's movement, this shows the seriousness of the government to make water as everybody, everybody's business. I would like to draw your attention that on completion of this huge feat, we shall be able to, a, to be a beacon of light for the countries who aspire to make water equitable. Water has the power to be a major equalizer of the world and India would like to lead this initiative through its experiences and achievements. Before I conclude, I must sh uh, say that everyone present here is concerned and understand the importance of water and sanitation. And that is expressly why we all are here. We have come from different parts of the world, but our goal is the same, to ensure equitable, clean water and sanitation for all, and to save this precious most gift of the mother nature for our future generations. I'm sure each of us is doing something for the attainment of this goal at an individual level, or at the organizational level. We come from organizations which are dedicated to this cause, but if we attempt to integrate our personal, institutional and organizational efforts on water, we will benefit those who are deprived, who cannot reach to the big forums and express their problems, find the solutions, and these are the people who need such forums the most. A shloka from Indian history, Holy Scripture, Rig Veda says, Om Sam Gachadvam Sam Vadadvam Sam Vau Mananshi Janatam Deva Bhagam Yathapurve Sanja Nana Upasate Om Samani Vayakuti Samana Radeyanive Samana Vastu Vomano Yathavasu Sahasati This means let us come together for common cause, let us speak in one voice, let our minds be in sync with each other, let our aim be one of the one and single, let our hearts be joined as one, united be our thought, uh, thoughts, may our intentions and aspirations be alike, may we be together in harmony. I wish such unison for all of us, let us ensure clean water and sanitation be the common objective for driving f and driving force to unify us as the time has arrived to take a plunge to dream together, to plan together, to collaborate together and to act together with the conviction before it is too late and we leave many compulsions to the generations coming next. With these, I conclude my words and I wish a grand success to World Water Week. Jai Hind. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your speech that started quite philosophically and then with a vision. Um, and then you put the global frameworks. We often wonder what are the SDGs or the NDCs, the Paris Agreement, are they really useful? But not only are you using them as an objective, but you're actually wanting to go ahead, reaching the targets, reaching the goals before you get there, and changing the structure, your governance, in order to enable that. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to the follow-up discussion that we're going to have with Mathilde Bouilly. She will be doing a scene setting of where we're at when it comes to looking at the SDGs and the indices. How can we implement them at the national and local level? She is the associate in the SDG delivery team and sustainable finance center of the World Resource Institute. She will give us a first a scene setting moment and then engage our prominent speakers here and experts into a fishbowl discussion. Now, as I said, you're all very welcome afterwards to join into the fishbowl. We have these two seats that are free for you to come up and sit and ask your questions uh, once we've been able to hear from our distinct speakers also. Mathilde, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miggy. Do you hear me well? 
Perfect. So it's a great honor and pleasure for me to moderate this session today. So our objective is to understand uh, how the SDG and NDC implementation are uh, helping make progress in advancing climate goals, how cl what I expect leverage the implementation of both agendas to uh, accelerate progress. And uh, we have a great panel to engage in this discussion with representatives from countries and institutions that face very diverse water risks and have asserted themselves in implementing the SDGs and indices. So we have with us uh, Minister uh, Kimo Tili Kainen, <laughs> Minister, um, State, State Secretary for uh, the Center Party's Ministerial Group of the Government on Finland. Uh, we also have uh, Jose Luis Acero, Vice Minister for Water and Sanitation of the Government of Colombia. Uh, Jurgen Kögel, Special Envoy to Lind Wise Sisulu, Minister for Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation of the Government of South Africa, who couldn't be with us today. Adanesh Yared Gilo, General Director of the Basins Development Authority of the Government of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and Christian Severin, Senior Environmental Specialist of the Global Environments Facility. Uh, so, as Maggie has uh, clearly explained, this is going to be a feasible discussion. So, our objective is to keep it interactive. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a very quick <laughs> presentation uh, to set out the stage, uh, highlight key opportunities and challenges that the SDG and NDC implementation present to advance water goals. So when it comes to water, uh, the SDG and climate agenda is one single agenda, um, achieving universal access to safe drinking water um, through sustainable management of water resources and mitigating the worst impact of climate change are strongly independent goals. Um, and we have recent data from the World Resources Institute that give a very worrisome landscape uh, to explain how uh, the climate change and the water crisis are fanning each other. So recent data from uh, the Atlas of Water Risk show that uh, 17 countries uh, that are home for one quarter of the world's population are already facing extremely high uh, water risk and so are extremely vulnerable to, to climate change. This, in these countries, uh, irrigation, agriculture, industries and municipalities withdrew already 80% of available water uh, on an annual basis, so there is very, uh, a very short room to face uh, climate change impacts and uh, other the other needs. So uh, we see that climate action is absolutely instrumental to achieve Edge Six. So uh, I'm going to uh, give you uh, an idea uh, of uh, how um, the what water goals. Uh, are embedded in the SDGs and NDC and how co countries at the national level are fostering synergies. Uh, so when it comes to the national coordination frameworks set up to advance the SDGs and NDCs, uh, we see that they offer both challenges and opportunities to water experts to engage. Uh, we know that uh, for the SDGs, the vast majority of lead institutions uh, are uh, from uh, very powerful uh, agencies. Uh, actually, the most common institutions that oversee SDG implementation are the offices from Prime Minister and from the Presidency. The Planning and Economic Finance Ministries also have a very strong role, while for the, the NTC agenda, uh, the Environment minister, Ministries are still uh, leading. Uh, and so the SDG and NDCs are advancing very distinct tracks in most countries. So we see very distinct lead institutions. We have also different strategies, different planning processes to set uh, the SDG targets and the NDCs, different tools to and guidance to mainstream the SDG targets and the actions embedded in the NDCs in two national development plans and very different monitoring and reporting processes. So this can create some inefficiencies, some duplications, uh, can overwhelm uh, also sector ministries um, and uh, lead to missed opportunities 
to uh, enhance synergies between both agendas, especially when it comes to uh, access to water, uh, sustainable development management of water and, and climate uh, action in the field of water. Uh, but at the same time, uh, having two processes also offer opportunities because we can uh, leverage the SDG processes to write the profile of, uh, of the water agenda and at the same time engage in the NDC to define uh, more um, specific targets when it comes to adaptation and mitigation. And we also have uh, more sources of funding available. We have seen that with the Green Climate Forums and the Green Environment Facilities. Um, and um, we, we will hear from uh, our panelists today how, how they use those processes to engage, mobilize more stakeholders and, uh, and raise finance for, for their agenda. So we know um, that the national implementation of the SDGs uh, on water is not on track. Uh, we have reviewed last year uh, the implementation of SDG 6. Um, that shows a very contrasted progress. Um, it's uh, clear that uh, the pledge to leave no one behind is not fulfilled yet at all. Um, there is a lot of disparities uh, building countries among countries. Just to give you an example, 88% uh, of the uh, countries have uh, targets, efforts to promote integrated water uh, management but this percentage fall down to 55% of the countries uh, of LDCs, uh, so low-income countries uh, that are the least, necessarily um, the most vulnerable to climate change. So we see that the LDCs provide a very strong opportunity to integrate water into national uh, policies. It's a very integrated agenda. The targets of the LDCs have been designed to be interdependent, uh, so can uh, invite um, the sector ministries, the planning ministries to uh, help understand the nexus between the water, food, energy uh, and, uh, and, and climate crisis. Uh, but uh, from our understanding at the right, based on our analysis, um, most of the process to mainstream the SDGs into national development plans are still very siloed uh, and there is little coordination between Ministry of, uh, of Environment, Water and other ministries uh, to work together on integrated solutions. Uh, there are also a lot of challenges around monitoring and data. You know that in the SDG uh, agenda you have a very strong target to uh, have disaggregated data for income, wealth, gender, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity group, um, migratory status. Uh, some progress have been done for basic services, um, especially disaggregated data in between rural and uh, urban areas uh, at the same national level, but we are still far from the degree of disaggregation we need to track progress for those who are left behind. Uh, if now I, I switch to the NDC agenda, we see, sorry, it was back. Uh, we see that uh, the water is strongly embedded in the SDGs. Actually, the last report from the Global Water Partnership will show that 9 out of 10 countries have water goals in the NDCs, which is a very good news. They have looked at 80 SDGs. Uh, the analysis of WRI uh, with the database Climate Watch also show that 160 NDCs out of 174 NDCs submitted uh, early this year have uh, targets on, uh, the, um, on water and aligned uh, with somehow with the SDG targets. So you see on this graph uh, a picture of uh, how the actions embedded in the NDCs align with the SDG targets. Um, so quickly uh, about half of the NDCs uh, address uh, key uh, SDGs on water quality, uh, water efficiency, uh, integrated water management and ecosystems. Uh, but when we look more into the details, we see major gaps. Uh, very few, too few uh, countries uh, have actions um, to, um, related to rainwater harvesting, only 32 NDCs. Um, wastewater management and desalin desalinization. So we have a great opportunity next year uh, because countries are invited to enhance, to 
upgrade uh, or at least review their indices by 2020. So that's uh, a good time to you know, incorporate more actions for adaptation and also for mitigation because mit water is not considered um, for mitigation purposes in most, most indices, while the nexus between water and energy is absolutely critical to achieve um, the SDG uh, and especially the target 6.1 on universal access to water. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities that are untapped and uh, we hope that uh, next year uh, countries will be able to, to raise their ambition. I also uh, want to flag uh, potential trade-offs between uh, the implementation of the SDGs and the indices if there is uh, insufficient coordination. So, for instance, we see that some countries uh, have strong strategies around hydropower um, and given um, forecast of uh, rainfalls uh, are obliged to uh, change those strategies to make sure that they will also face growing demand for uh, safe drinking water. And I know that Colombia uh, has revised uh, its uh, it strategy to decarbonize the energy sector, to diversify uh, the, uh, the sources of power, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, water availability uh, will be there in, um, to ensure water availability in the, in the coming decades. Um, so I'm going to close here. The NDC enhancement and the revision of the NDC is going to be big topics for the summits on climate action and the SDGs planned uh, this September back to back. Uh, so uh, I'm very um, uh, looking forward to hear from our panelists what are their plans, their expectations from uh, for, for these summits uh, to uh, ramp up ambition on, uh, on, uh, on water goals. Thank you. So now we're going to shift to uh, the more interactive discussions. So based on what we have seen here, I'm interested in uh, hearing from uh, our panelists um, if, in their view, the parties set to achieve the SDGs and the actions embedded in the NDCs reflect their uh, parties, their top goals for water. And um, I'm, we would like to better understand so how you leverage the implementation of the SDGs and NDCs to uh, make progress on, on those uh, priorities related to water. And here also, what kind of barriers do you face? Uh, do you succeed in receiving more funding? <laughs> uh, if not, why? Uh, do you succeed in uh, mobilizing more stakeholders because of the national coordination framework around the SDGs and NDCs? So I mean, we, we're gonna have more time to elaborate on this, but just give us uh, your, your first thoughts on how you're using both processes. Minister Tilly Kennan. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. <coughs> I hope you can hear me. And uh, now we are thrown to fist ball. It's time to learn to swim, <laughs> I think. I, I try to do my best. So uh, my first uh, message is that um, we can achieve SDGs and implement Paris Agreement and NDC only at the same time. So they can't be done separately. We have to think them at the same time. Let me start by um, saying a few words how Finland has uh, implemented uh, SDGs. Um, our approach is twofold. First, uh, we, uh, our government shows very strong political leadership and commitment that SDGs must be implemented. That's one message. But uh, you know that uh, it's not a declaration that, uh, that makes uh, things happen. We need, uh, we need to engage the whole society and all stakeholders in the implementation by participatory partnerships. And how to do that? We have um, introduced several tools. First one we have used for already 25 years is that our prime minister is leading a national commission for sustainable development and there is uh, dozens of stakeholders uh, participating in this this um, commission. Second uh, tool is uh, uh, society's commitment 
to sustainable development. It's a commitment that, for example, private businesses or schools or associations, NCOs, or even ministries or parties can give how they can contribute to implement Agenda 2030. And these uh, commitments are published in Internet so that, <laughs> for example, private businesses, when they say that we are going to implement SDGs this way, uh, they take them very seriously because everyone can check if they are really doing that or not, uh, not just saying it. And we have received 2,000 commitments, mainly from private companies and uh, schools, but even from private citizens, uh, that how they can contribute uh, to implement uh, SDGs. And one of the most powerful commitments is a uh, uh, very wide and comprehensive commitment uh, uh, the founding partners of these commitments were Finnish research institutes, some ministries and WWF Finland, and that's uh, called Finnish Water Stewardship Commitment. These founders are challenging private companies to assess water risks in their value chain and to develop sustainable water use and governance. But, and it's not only limited the uh, assessment of water risks within Finnish borders, because we have global companies, global actors, they need to do that worldwide in their value chain. Uh, this is a very interesting um, uh, commitment how to uh, take care of water bodies once you are implementing SDGs. And third tool, the newest tool how to implement SDGs is the budgetary process. We call it sustainable development budgeting. We have started that just a couple of years ago and the idea is simple. How our budgetary process in the Ministry of Finance and in other ministries are supporting implementation of SDGs. And our main focus has so far been carbon neutral and resource-wise Finland. Carbon neutrality that, of course, uh, is related to climate, and then how to promote circular economy to uh, uh, use, very wise our natural resources. Uh, so this budgetary process, uh, we are developing that, and I have a lot of expectations to that. Um, then, uh, Finland is a blessed country with a lot of uh, water resources. Sometimes, uh, we may think that it's self-clear that we have uh, clean water and sanitation and pure lakes, but it hasn't always been the case. Uh, I still remember my childhood a couple of decades ago, uh, and in that time, industries and municipal wastewater has destroyed uh, many lakes and rivers. But through the very ambitious regulation and technological development, we have improved the condition a lot. We have still work to do, but we have seen that you can also uh, turn the development to the better direction. Um, SDG 17 talks about partnership, what our minister from India uh, say very strong words. And this partnership means that we have to work together with our neighbors. Finland has history of transboundary water management plans with Sweden, Norway and Russia. And, uh, but the, uh, before getting there so that you uh, work together uh, to take care of water resources, you need political will. For example, uh, the water management plan uh, and agreement with Russia, it's more than 50 years old and it was uh, agreed on a couple of decades after we were fighting in Second World War. <laughs> and it started from the political will that we need to uh, agree how to use common water resources. Mm. And then we went on to the um, uh, details. And I think uh, in very many corners of the world, it's even now, it has been in history today, but even uh, more in future when we see the lack of water that uh, if we can't solve how to use common water resources there will be huge amount of conflicts around the world. So uh, this is very important thing when we are implementing uh, um, SDGs do it together in partnership with uh, other countries. My last point if you still allow <laughs> one minute uh, 
about the climate change. We all know how uh, critical and um, the situation is. Uh, and I wish that we can see a lot of improvements uh, under Paris Agreement when we have a chance to update our NDCs, NDCs uh, next year. Uh, Finland has set ourselves very demanding target. We would like to achieve carbon neutrality. So balance between emissions and sinks by 2035. I don't know yet how we can do it, but that is the situation throughout the world that we must uh, take targets and commitments and start to work very seriously to reach them. As a presidency of European Union, Finland, uh, we are looking forward that we can finalize the European Union commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050. Hopefully we can do that and hopefully we can tell that to the rest of the world in the uh, next COP in Chile that, uh, uh, that uh, we will do that. And my last point is that uh, it's once again partnership and uh, also uh, how uh, to combine the, the distinct lead institutions you were, Mathilde, talking about. Uh, Finland and Chile are chairing, um, uh, chairing coalition of, uh, climate coalition of uh, finance ministers. Mm -hmm. We are challenging ministries of finance to take more responsibility on uh, implementing Paris Agreement and NDCs. A uh, little less than 40 countries has joined to this initiative, uh, but uh, it's very important that it's not only the responsibility of ministries of environment. This is whole society and finance, uh, uh, ministries of finance can play a very big pro role in this. And this is what we are doing together with Chile. Thank you, and Thank sorry you. for the long introduction. That was a very interesting introduction, and Finland is one of the few countries that have started to develop a very integrated approach to uh, access and, and climate change, and is very vocal on the how to enhance uh, institutional coordination and also cross-boundary coordination to address water issues at, at, at you know at the, the roots of the crisis. It's very interesting. So I turn myself to uh, Minister uh, Acero. So Colombia has a lot of water resources is ranking uh, 24 I think uh, in the um, uh, the index of countries uh, having uh, water availability so water resources but sometimes you're extremely vulnerable to climate change and so also uh, under threat of uh, facing water scarcity in the in the coming decades because of uh, issues related with the maintain of uh, water ecosystems um, and so it would be very interesting to hear from you so how you uh, uh, tackle so this uh, nexus between uh, climate change, uh, growing demand for uh, electricity and energy. So how you have shifted uh, your energy uh, strategy, and uh, and uh, how you also uh, link um, efforts uh, in the water agenda with uh, with the peace process because the regions that are you know vulnerable are also in transition. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. First. Um, Glad to join this visual with you as well, and uh, here at CWE, thank you as well. Uh, you mentioned a lot of things first, <laughs> so uh, I will just start the, the the conversation saying and mentioning, and reminding the audience that Colombia has been a quite vocal leader in the in all the SDGs and the climate change agenda since the beginning, and uh, we've been always ratifying our will to continue in this path. And we also do so by uh, in including all the goals and the targets within our national uh, development plans, within our sectorial goals, our strategies. Uh, and I think that uh, it's uh, just quite, uh, uh, it's kind of the first step to show the world that we are just uh, engaged and we will continue to be engaged uh, in these matters. Um, I wanted just to... Um, mention a little bit of the process so that I can go mm -hmm. drill it uh, on the specific subjects uh, that you just mentioned. Colombia has a quite, uh, let's say, uh, integrated approach to this thing. So um, 
when we uh, agree on the SDG agenda, we set up some annualized targets to meet the, the SDG goals uh, by 2030. And then we set up uh, monitoring and, and an MRB uh, institutional uh, framework and systems so that we could include those targets and that uh, system into our national development plan, which is, is at the end uh, our navigation uh, chart, let's say, by, by the government, uh, uh, for each government. Uh, we have four year governments in, in Colombia presidentials. Um, so, and one important thing here is that our national development plan, it's built through a highly, let's say, collaborative uh, process. Mm -hmm. It's a six month process. We took office in, on, on August last year. And uh, so you have uh, more or less six months in which uh, you pass through all these steps in which almost most of the uh, let's say, uh, country representative from all the sectors uh, and all the, uh, let's say, organizations are involved in the process. So first you have the uh, National uh, Planning Council in which you discuss the first draft. In this National Planning Council, you have um, minority organizations, private sector, academia, uh, uh, national, legal, uh, regional and local uh, governments. Then you have, uh, they agree on this first, a draft, then you have the president of the Ministry of Councils who uh, just uh, signed that new uh, first draft, then you have the National Planning Department uh, coordinating with the, each ministries, and then you have all these uh, steering committees, inter-ministerial committees as well, um, that uh, let's say put um, uh, a check on the plan, and then it goes to Congress. For, uh, no, sorry. Then it goes to the minority groups, indigenous people and, and Afro-Colombians, that they have to agree with the national plan. No? Uh, and then it goes to Congress to be discussed and then uh, passes a law. Uh, so that is the way you ensure that all the country is aligned as well with the SDG agenda and the climate change agenda. Uh, because all the objectives are embedded in... I mean, we, we have sectorial objectives, but also we have a specific overall, ref, um, let's say, strategies in, within the plan that respond what we as a country uh, committed to the world to, to achieve within the, uh, in the decade. Um, for the water sector, we have highly ambitious, uh, I could go uh, more in depth in the, in the following round if you want. Uh, we have set specific programs for these zones that you you were mentioned uh, that we have the let's say lagged regions in which the conflict was mostly let's say uh, active yes so we have a special program called uh, blue guajira which is for the north part of a region uh, let me uh, give a commercial here i would like all of you to join me and join the, the government and the, and and the and the country, this is a highly uh, a high profile program in the country. It's, a, oh, uh, it's the most ambition program, ambitious program for that region. Um, I will just give you a number. Uh, the coverage for the rural areas in, in, in La Guajira was just 4% when we took office. Now it's 9%. It's, I mean, we have a, and, and our main goal is to set up, is to end up this uh, in three years in 70%. So it's, uh, uh, I'm comparing with the Minister of India that he was discussing the, all of his big goals as well. We are kind of aligned in that in in, in this endeavor. But um, so with that, those focalized programs in these specific zones is is how we are trying to uh, move forward in the in the SDG agenda. Because one one key thing to mention, and I think most of, of the countries in the middle high income. A middle high income, um, uh, let's say, uh, a branch. Uh, the last mile is very hard to achieve. No, we, the Colombia has a 92% coverage overall. 96 in urban areas, 70%, uh, I'm talking about water, 70% in the rural areas. Uh, walking that last mile, 
you know, to to reach out to to reach the universal coverage is very hard. It's more complex. It's it's more costly. So uh, uh, we hope uh, and and uh, one way to answer one of your questions is that thanks to the SDGs is how we are telling the the the, the international. Uh, uh, donors uh, telling us well uh, internally to the private sector that we need to do more effort to walk that last mile mm -hmm. and we need to be more coordinated to be able to achieve the SDGs. So thank you. I think Colombia is a great example of countries that try to use the SDGs as an integration tool and communication tool. I mean, you have been at the origin of the concept and uh, you're still showing the way on how to bring together this, this agenda as at the national and local level with specific uh, priorities for the different regions as you have alighted. So I tell myself to uh, Jörn Kogel, so your representative South Africa here. We are all with uh, images from uh, Cape Town in mind. Uh, you're facing <laughs> yeah, uh, very impressive uh, challenges regarding water scarcity. So. Can you explain us so what are your uh, top priorities when it comes to adaptation uh, to climate change to ensure uh, water availability in the coming uh, years? Good. Thank you, Matilda. Well, first of all, greetings from the Southern Hemisphere. You know, we are the only ones really representing uh, the Southern Hemisphere or Southern Africa in that sense in any case. Um, and I'm mentioning that is because so much of what we've heard in this week is just that cooperation between business and, and governments and um, NGOs and so on happen to be uh, taking place in the Northern Hemisphere. We have very little interaction with corporates in the way they do here, present the commitment. The second thing is, is that we had to decide what does climate change mean for Southern Africa. And once again, I agree with the minister, you have to do it in a region or a cooperative basis. And in Southern Africa, we do that. So the solution in South Africa would include Namibia, Botswana, even as high up as Mozambique. And that is just the reality uh, that we had, um, that we want to have actually, because if you don't do that, then systems don't work. And over and above that, the new minister um, brings the political will. Again, I agree with you, without political will, you won't have results. Um, and that political will is, is represented in a panel of advisors that uh, wishes to implement those decisions that have been made, whether they're in support of Paris or our own designs. Uh, we're no longer talking about policy discussions or uh, finding uh, uh, another way of looking at the, uh, at the problem. Uh, we are basing our actions now in implementing. And what does that mean? Uh, climate change for Southern Africa means that rain uh, falls are moving east as opposed to where they currently are. The problem for that is, is that, and for those who enjoy South African wines in Cape Town, <laughs> the rain is moving away from Cape Town and the winery re uh, regions. And that means we have to relook on how uh, a world class. Uh, destination also for us as labor um, intensive um, orientated government policies what to do about Cape Town which means uh, preservation recycling uh, and moving to irrigation as opposed to just looking at uh, uh, natural things uh, and we just have to do it and we're busy doing that uh, because it was an, an embarrassment uh, that Cape Town has run dry and we do not wish to have that repeated uh, and it, it doesn't have to be repeated. If we do this properly, if we can. The good side is, though, is, is that, uh, that the current w dam levels in the Western Cape um, are now at 80% again. You know, we, we had the drought issue around 30 to 20%. And what that then also means that given that agriculture is the biggest consumer of uh, water, uh, that that has to, has to move. And those have, um, that move will have political implications for the whole region including who owns water licenses how they manage it and regulate and we will address that in such a way it becomes more equitable you know, we need to have more black farmers all of that has to be done the last thing about uh, um, south africa is, is that without water we wouldn't have any energy even the renewal energy uh, industry requires a lot of water so 
95% of our energy requires water, whether it's nuclear or the coal phase thing, uh, um, generation. And, um, and there's a discrepancy that, uh, that most of the electricity is generated in quite high water, high rainwater level. But some of it has to be shipped to the coast and that loses almost 40 to 50% of that is which is generated. So we have to decentralize the energy side, again, cognizant of what uh, local or more regional water sources are as opposed to uh, um, funneling uh, water from, uh, from the, the mountains, wherever. And then the last thing that we need to say is, is whatever we've implemented around uh, climate change and um, meeting measurements of our own designs, is that you cannot do it without managing and capacitating local communities. Uh, it's nice to have political will and all of that stuff and designs, but unless you capacitate uh, rural, especially rural municipalities and populations, uh, you will not be able to implement it. And that's where we, uh, that's where we're focusing. Uh, and on, on our side in South Africa, that's even more important because mining has got a mixed legacy. Uh, around water use and contamination, but it's also a very important uh, industry for us. So asset water, recycling, all of those stuff um, will come in and it will have to come in um, uh, over and above regulatory demands. We wish to have investor activity to say gold mines or, or uh, uh, energy generating institutions you're not going to get money or shareholders funds or debt uh, unless you clean up your act and, and in that sense uh, the world bank has been leading um, that kind of stakeholder activism so we're looking forward to more of that thank you, thank you. I think it was a great uh, way to share experiences in uh, facing some key challenges in transforming energy and agricultural sectors so how you you adapt to uh, handle in a more balanced way the different uh, needs for water uh, so I turn myself to Mr. Jilu, the other representative from uh, um, the African continent. Uh, uh, you're from Ethiopia and you're in charge of uh, managing uh, the basin. And so your perspective is going to complement, I think, what we uh, hear, uh, heard uh, from uh, uh, the uh, other panelists. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for that. I would like to give thanks for inviting me for this great participation or uh, great event. Um, as uh, you know, the Ethiopia is a fastly growing country uh, from Africa. So uh, as inside of any SDG uh, goals, there is water inside of mm -hmm. uh, the SDG goals, 17 goals inside. So we have uh, inside, we have water. So. Uh, we are doing a lot uh, to achieve this SDG goal and also NDC goal. Uh, one is in hydropower, that is because most of our uh, energy is generated from hydropower. So we construct them um, for hydropower purpose and also we are working in the watershed management work. Mm -hmm. So this one is contribute a lot for climate change. So. Uh, and also in the water supply and sanitation part. So most of the people live in rural areas, so water supply to address these people and also the sanitation part is required. So the agriculture and irrigation is one part. So normally our government give focus uh, uh, in this water, energy uh, and uh, irrigation sectors. So our ministry is water irrigation and energy. Uh, so business development authority is one accountable federal government uh, or federal office for this uh, ministry. So uh, this video work in the or business development authority work uh, uh, to protect this resource because mm -hmm. the business is the resource of the water. So the water is um, for hydropower, water supply, irrigation, and so on. Mm -hmm. on we need for this one. So 
Previously, uh, the government gave attention for some basins. Currently, at the end of October 2018, rearrangement is done in the ministry and uh, one federal business development authority to address whole 12 basins of Ethiopia. We have 12 basins, nine wet and three dry. So also to address this one, uh, it is reestablished. Even the government give focus the irrigation part, huge irrigations to feed our people and others could to contribute for other, others and also for this SEDG uh, uh, goals to uh, fulfill these goals. And it's grow up into commission, irrigation development commission, also to address the water issue, also the development organized water development commission, mm -hmm. and uh, everything is organizing to fulfill this one. So finally, as you hear, uh, we have a big campaign, green campaign in Ethiopia, uh, at one day to plant 200 million trees. So we achieved that goal already, we plant great more than 315 million trees at one day. So uh, we had a plan to plant 4 billion trees at three months. Already that campaign was open at May 25 by our PM and mm -hmm. it's closed at uh, July 23 also by him. So already we achieved uh, this one. So our government a fix many for fulfillment of this SDG issues and climate change issue issues mm -hmm. because this one is planting and so on is, is contributing for climate change issues because Ethiopia is one country af uh, faced by climate change, a lot of uh, floods and also droughts. Mm -hmm. So to manage this one, serious work uh, is required in Ethiopia also to contribute uh, as one part of the world. So uh, we are working a lot. Even my organization is working a lot. The government uh, allocate the money for this purpose, for uh, integrated water source management purpose. Also, we already uh, propose, uh, develop the national integrated water source uh, program. And also we propose until 2030 strategic plans, mm. the Ministry of Water Irrigation and Energy, including irrigation water and uh, energy, we develop a strategic plan. So, so we are, our country is doing a lot related with this one. The last one is in the collaboration and working together during this campaign, green campaign or the green comp uh, this uh, green program, uh, the three uh, ministries are guide this program, Ministry of our Ministry, Ministry of Water, Water Irrigation and Energy, Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture and Environment, Forest and Climate Change Commission, together with other ministries. Mm -hmm. So integration with different group is, is, is uh, as show a great change and it's for, uh, to achieve our goal. It's just, very necessary, so we are working even in this uh, area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think you, you you bring another perspective and putting emphasis on nature-based solutions and all the benefits for uh, the adaptation agenda and uh, the, the water availability agenda. So thank you very much for this. We have very limited time, so I don't have any uh, signal to uh, tell you <laughs> when to finish, but uh, we, we want to hear a bit from the audience. I give you quickly uh, the floor, Christian. I'm sorry that you're the last one to intervene. You're going to bring the regional perspective uh, with your expertise in uh, in integrated water management. I'll, I'll do it in a couple of minutes. Well, thank, thank you so much for inviting me here today and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I represent the Global Environment Facility here today and uh, also bring greetings from my CEO, Nao Koishi, that couldn't make it here, unfortunately. She's in Japan right now. Um, but what we, we just heard from four countries here, so it's, it's actually very fitting that I can talk a little bit about the regional perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, we, we heard from, especially from Finland, we, you know, talked about this idea, or not the idea, but the, com uh, the concept of working across boundaries to address some of these issues. Not only water, but also climate. Many, many of them demand, of course, local action and a lot of local investments. But we also need to look at this in a, in a, in a, across these, these uh, political boundaries. Because none, none of the issues that we're trying to deal with in the SDGs, or very few of them, uh, stop at the border. They, they tend to uh, interfere with, with mm -hmm. your neighbors. 
So that, that's what we have been doing from the, the Global Environment Facility. We're, we're trying to assist countries in this process in, um, in getting transboundary water agreements, uh, both through our, our funding, but also through organizations like the UNECE Water Convention that I know that, you're, that, that Finland and everybody here is, is working very closely with. So I think that, that's some of the opportunities that we will see more of. And I think that we do need to have these, not only the partnerships, but simply share the data and get, uh, get, build trust I mean, partnerships and, and trust are, are two very well-connected uh, issues. So I think w in order to deal with, with, uh, with water issues, uh, both in a, in a national context, but especially in a, in a, in a, in a larger concept, like uh, look at the Orange River, how the Orange River then is. It's a matter of working across this, and finding out what, how do we um, address the local issues, but how do we make sure there's enough water for everybody in the entire watershed. And then, of course, eventually this water runs into the coast, and then that's when you have the Benguela current. So we, we also need to start looking at that and the, the, the interconnectionship between these different SDGs, the 14 and 6. And mm -hmm. So, so it, I mean, it, it is very short, and I only have a minute yeah. and a half, so I'll stop right there. We, we still have no. ten, 10 minutes, but uh, we want to hear from the audience. So we have two major committees. Summit, sorry, coming in a, in a three weeks now. Uh, so it would be interesting to hear what should be the, the parties at the agendas of uh, of the countries and of other stakeholders. What what are the major gaps uh, you see in uh, in your field um, that uh, should be uh, prioritized in in September? So feel free to to chime in. Don't be shy. <laughs> You can also take a seat uh, in the uh, inner circle. And I think uh, Jennifer has some microphones. Everyone is very quiet. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. You, you can, yeah, just take this one. Hi, I'm Victoria Granström representing um, IKEA Industry and IKEA of Sweden. And I'm so impressed and so glad to hear about India. Wow, they say. But I want to have, I have one point shortly. That is that the technologies are there, the engineering is there. It's implemented in so many places on a global level. Please go out and ask suppliers, companies, what is already implemented and works. That okay. is just my point. Do it. Strunkle. Don't invent the technologies that are already there. Thank you. Anyone else? A key, key message from your perspective for these summits? What should deserve more focus? Should be prioritized? <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> everyone is sleeping. Um, so I'm going to revert back to you. Uh, we have um, a great opportunity next year to uh, review uh, progress uh, made uh, in the implementation of the NDCs and a uh, great opportunity to ramp up the ambition, both in uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation. So as uh, experts in the world field are in charge of uh, water departments, so how do you think you're going to engage in this process and uh, what going to be your priorities? If I may, Matilda, um, in South Africa, we decided to combine water matters with human settlement. Because wherever you would go in the application of water, whether it is in, in a mining village or a, a, a mining settlement, uh, a power station village, um, and they're all in the rural areas and certainly in our part of the world, is just that combining the development of human settlements um, it cannot be divorced from water policy of any kind. You have to have that integrated. And then the second thing with that comes um, the implementation in water catchment areas and management thereof, which mostly are also in rural areas again. And the rural economies, certainly in most of Africa, but in our part of Africa, uh, the key actors are women. Um, who require microfinancing and other support in order to be really effective in, in, in those um, policy implementations. So uh, we will not be able to just look at water without looking at humans and the way they are being uh, settling 
in, in the semi-rural areas of South Africa. The biggest cities, and that includes Cape Town, you, you, we agree with you, the technologies, the capacity, the application and the pol political will is there to do it. Um, why did Cape Town happen? Um, I suppose we underestimated how fast rainfall patterns have changed and moved. But then there's always politics, so political will to go over politics uh, is important. And, well, we, we won't repeat that. And we want you to continue buying our wines. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, Minister uh, Tilly Kennan. Uh, our Colombian friend uh, spoke about uh, the last mile, the uh, problem how to get the things done in the remote areas and also we heard about the rural areas problem. So uh, I think that uh, many times um, SDGs are very much connected to each other and one of my favorite uh, uh, examples is, if I can give one, is uh, what, how we can uh, start uh, development in off-grid areas. So uh, there are so many uh, hundreds of millions of uh, people living off-grid areas without access of energy at the moment. But the current solar power, you can bring access to energy. But it's not only that you can get affordable and clean energy. Once you have solar powers, you can clean water. So <laughs> another SDC is met, and once you can uh, have energy and clean water, and if you put that uh, facility next to the school, you can get girls to school because they don't need to spend their time of walking miles to get water to the family. They can go to school. And once you can get uh, clean water and sanitation, it helps gender equality in those areas and it improves the uh, health and of course the results of education once you can participate more to the education. So uh, this solar panel in off-grid area is not just a little piece of uh, renewable energy. It can start very positive uh, development and that's a good example how different SDGs are very much integrated to each other and also to implementing the uh, clean energy targets. And a key uh, challenge to enhance the energy system. This is, this is actually everything we're doing up in the northern Colombia. Yeah. That's, that's the mm. way we're doing and I, uh, I like to invite Finland to uh, walk with us uh, because I'm just answering your first question that I didn't answer part is up, that's, that's kind of a desert, right? So we are creating this uh, huge uh, both wind farms and solar farms, let's say, like with solar panels. And those are the ones who will be, uh, let's say, um, our desalination plants, which will take from wells. You know? we, we have aquifers that uh, are um, uh, needs to be desalinized. Uh, we'll use that energy, which will reduce the cost by 40% of the, of the, of the plants. Uh, and we will be doing what you said, where we have the wells, where we have the the points where the people will go for, for to access water, because we we will not be able to just uh, build a hundred kilometers of pipes uh, to those scattered areas. Um, but then we will, what we want to do is just to uh, provide more services, in which I mean education services. Um, you, you can have uh, information uh, centers for the people to go and and so it's kind of an inter integrated approach in which you have. Climate action as well, like climate, uh, uh, we will reduce the cost of energy. We will, uh, and then we will walk that mile in that, in uh, with that approach. So Thank you. Um, yes. I mean, we we have like two minutes, so one minute each. <laughs> yes, Christian. Doing less than a <coughs> less than a minute. Um, so what you started out asking if the donors, if you're getting more money for this to deal with this and yeah, I, I would actually, I would actually like to say that you know, the GF experienced a really good replenishment this time around and, mm -hmm. and water specifically, uh, the, the transboundary water management got the biggest replenishment ever uh, financially. Mm -hmm. So I mean there, there is, there is a, a push, there is a, it's been identified, donors know it, we all know how important both fresh and marine waters are for not only achieving SDGs and, and human health and economic growth but just in general for, for 
for human beings mm. and our livelihood. So I, I do I, I do see it, and that's very positive that there is more money coming into this arena. Thank you, Christian. Okay, yeah. uh, I want to say something for in the last. So, uh, as we know, the Ethiopia is the topography is complex. So related with this uh, campaign, by the way, we have uh, planned to add to plant 10 billion trees in the next year. So we need to use drone planting system. So anyone, uh, anyone work want to work wi uh, with us uh, related with this uh, goal or uh, to achieve this goal uh, related with climate change and also integrated water source management system. Uh, the door of Ethiopia is it's free and open at any time to work together and to collaborate together. So I invite any group who want to work with us, any issue related with water, irrigation, energy, and also the climate change adaptation and mitigation methods. So we use mostly the, the, the countrywide plantation, that means um, home plantation types. So that one is uh, it's contribute a lot for this the climate change issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's the end of this session. If we, you have all highlighted how you are building on the SDG targets to uh, advance your your priorities, and you have uh, showed different uh, nexus between uh, the energy transition, uh, transition of some uh, agricultural sectors, uh, the preservation of uh, watersheds and water ecosystems, and uh, how an integrated approach is absolutely needed to, to scale up progress. So thank you for uh, this contribution to the discussion on NDC and SDG implementation. How we, we have started to explain that uh, the countries are still advancing the agendas in distinct tracks, but actually when it comes to uh, implementation at the sectoral level, a lot of integrated solutions are, are put forward. So it's, uh, it's great news and uh, we uh, hope to hear uh, more uh, in a few weeks uh, from uh, the uh, uh, from these summits to, to see how what are going to be featured in uh, in the priorities uh, of the uh, heads of states and government and next year in uh, the renew NDC. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, um, I think our next speaker is actually going to answer y the question that you just posed. So I'm very happy to welcome Patrick, uh, the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, who's going to give us a, a bit of a breaking news of what's going to happen in the next coming weeks at the UN Climate Summit and what the Global Commission on Adaptation is doing too. Thank you. For and afterwards, uh, we have, uh, yes, you can take the mic. We have a quick coffee break for those um, outside, but please come back very quickly after where we're going to talk talk about what's happening at the city level. So very excited to hear the next round on that. Uh, thank you. So I thought uh, I have a speech here, which is about 10 minutes long, which you're not interested in. So let's just put that aside. Um, building on the breaking news, let me just bring back um, a personal story. About a year ago, uh, I was in Jennifer Saras, who's taking a picture now, uh, her office. Jennifer, as you know, she is leading the, the water practice of the World Bank Group but she also was the key architect behind the high level on, pen, uh, on water. And I said to her in her office, let's set up a global commission on adaptation. And Jennifer said, really? An another commission, another panel, is that truly changing the world? Is that not sort of old wine in, in new bags? And I said, well, actually it is, but, but it isn't. Because two years ago we were here and the high-level panel on water, and some of you perhaps even remember it, they came out with their recommendations, their sort of action agenda, actually your agenda, making the case why water needs to be elevated at the global level. Basically stating why it is a moral imperative to invest in water. Also actually re-articulating the high and dry report of 2016 of the World Bank, why it's an economic um, argument to invest in water. So we came here, we engaged, we, we said we're going to engage with the water community. And some of you, or perhaps even most of you said, there is nothing new in the high level panel on water. All the solutions which were written, we knew. I said, well actually, that's precisely the point. I mean, we were standing on your shoulders, making the case to the global community. As the minister from Finland said, it, yes, it is about water ministers, 
but it is also about finance ministers and it is about mayors and it is about business. So these leaders in the high level panel on water made the case on your behalf at sort of the high level General Assembly two years ago. Well, what is true two years ago is certainly true today that sort of this political momentum is insufficient. So when I, for Ambassador, when I was in, uh, in Chile last week, I had the honor to meet, yes, of course, with your water minister, but also with your foreign minister and your finance minister and your environment minister. All of them said water adaptation is going to be the top priority of the COP. So I said, well, actually, is that truly the case? Because what we have seen over the last few years, this notion of, yes, mitigation and adaptation are both equally important. In reality, at the global level, that is not true. So I didn't challenge the ministers that directly, but that was sort of my sort of underlying uh, current. So I said, well, maybe we as the Global Commission on Adaptation could help you, your presidency, and then actually represent this community. How? How is this Global Commission different than the high-level panel on water? I mean, I would say three things. One, the high-level panel on water was two years ago. This is now, right? The urgency is even is, is more intense. So there is this need of this political mobilization. So timing is different. We're two years later in the game. Two, it is the composition. I remember, I see Enchady here. Um, I see others. The high-level panel on water, I think it's too, important to realize, it was sitting heads of states and government. Never before, we've been telling this story over and over again, never before have sitting heads of states and government been constituting a panel arguing for water. It had an advantage because they had the floor in the General Assembly, but it also had a disadvantage because there are government policies and we need to go back to a Greek language and yes, we already have the SDGs, so let's not be too bold, well, bold, but not too bold. So in the Global Commission on Adaptation, we flipped the story. In the sense, we have heads of states and government engaged. Prime Minister Modi is engaged. President Xi Jinping is engaged. Chancellor Merkel is engaged as conveners. So we have over 20 plus sitting heads of states and government called conveners of this commission. What does that mean? It basically means it provides the political space for the Global Commission to operate. Then Global Commission has commissioners, obviously. So there are 30 odd commissioners, finance ministers, mayors, um, civil society voices, chaired by three people. One, Ban Ki-moon. Ban Ki-moon was the one who initiated the high-level panel on water, out of office. So we said, okay, now you drive this. Then we thought, okay, Ban Ki-moon, that's good, but that's still UN-ish, which only goes so far. Would it not be great to get this is a movement building at the same time to get a big voice. A person who has never joined any commission on any topic, let alone on climate, let alone on climate adaptation. So Bill Gates was the target. And Gates said, yes, I'm in after some um, maneuvering, provided that this commission is not just another report. Yes, the commission will deliver a report September 10, but it also has to be on action, and I'll come to that in a second. So Gates in, Ban Gates. And then the third person who is leading this is Kristalina Georgieva. Most of you know her, some of you don't. She is the CEO of the World Bank. She is heading, we hope, to head um, the IMF. So those three are driving this um, Global Commission on Adaptation. The third difference is timing and composition. The third one is the scope of work. So this commission, as I said, will deliver a report. It comes out on September 10, hashtag adapt our world. When you read it, again, you would say, the, the vice president would say, actually, I know all of this. I, I know all of this. These are my talking points. And that's all true. It's about the moral case, about the economic case and the, and the right to water and integrating water into our uh, development pathways. Everything is there. But what it also will do as a second track, and I think that is what is breaking news, uh, Maggie or not, it is, there is a new domain. The Global Commission on Adaptation on, in New York on September 24, the day after the summit, and hopefully you will join and the minister would join, 
it will launch the year of action. The year of action, obviously, I mean, it's sort of a communication uh, phrase, right? Year of action, but it is. So what it will happen is it, that on certain themes, water, infrastructure, cities, finance, new coalitions are designed, are formulated, are catalyzed, driving into, yes, another summit, the Global Adaptation Summit in the Netherlands on October 22nd. So this is the logic. September 23, summit in New York. The leaders will make statements about national commitments. We heard from the minister what India's sort of commitment in the broad spaces, including in water. We will, most of it, we quite frankly, we, we can predict what they will say, more or less. But what we want to do, we want to drive that further the day after. Okay, we had the summit. What are we now going to do the day after? So the year of action is starting, culminating, goes through the Chile Cup, culminating at this Netherlands-hosted um, adaptation uh, summit. And now my sort of request to you is this. So we can be cynical about summits, we can be cynical about commissions, and sometimes it is even uh, justified, I dare to say. But it also provides an opportunity for this community, for our community, for us, to basically mutually exploit this global commission. Make your case, your solutions, um, and bring them into place through this trajectory. We call them action tracks. And we hope to see you in the Netherlands on October 22nd, not just Colombia, Colombia is important, but perhaps the Vice Minister can mobilize the region to bring along uh, with additional uh, commitments. That's in a nutshell what the Global Commission intends to do. Fast forward, see we next year. Um, as I understand it, thank you, Tony. The topic, the theme will be accelerating adaptation action. So we have these upcoming milestones where we can basically keep each other honest on what, to go back to uh, Jennifer's question, what's really, um, what's really the results framework? Are we really driving action? Is it really make a difference? And I think throughout this journey, uh, we can basically co-design this ourselves. So hopefully you will accept this uh, irresistible offer to join this movement on adaptation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Patrick. So break. Quickly, coffee, bathrooms, <laughs> and come back in 10 minutes so we can talk about cities. Thank you. For okay, uh, welcome back to the second part of our session or our event on building a resilient future through water. If we cover the global picture, SDG, the climate issues, in the first part of the session, now we turn to more a reality in the sense of we have invited a number of city leaders to discuss with them how to really make this happen on a city level. And I think that is most important. I think the linkage is what is being done on the local ground to what we are discussing at global level. That is most important. So with these few words, I would like now to introduce Fred Boltz, who will uh, take us through this session. And Fred, he is the water lead for the global center adaptation and his ambassador for the resilience shift and i would like fred now to introduce the topic yeah. please fred <laughs> oh thank you thank you tony thank you sir thank you very much good morning everyone welcome thanks for those who uh, have come back from the first part of this session we're turning now to uh, uh from um, from a discussion on policy to uh, a discussion on action uh, as my good friend and colleague uh, Patrick Verkuyen noted at the end of last session, uh, we have the policies in place, we have all the agreements that we need, we have the basis, the framework for doing things, we're not acting quickly enough. Uh, we should be talking about accelerating action. Uh, I'm going to frame the session, we'll then have a, a keynote by Suzanne Dorisil from the, the German government, I'll, I'll introduce in a moment. And then we're going to move into some examples of the actions being taken by city leaders around the globe and by the institutions that are working hand in hand with those city leaders to confront our climate challenge, to confront our global water challenge. <clears throat> Is there a remote control? Great. Thank you. That's me. <clears throat> Pardon me. I have the honor of serving as the water lead for the Global Center on Adaptation, which is supporting the Global Commission on Adaptation that Patrick described earlier. 
commissions led by Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates, and Kristalina Georgieva, who recognized, as I said, we have the agreements in place, we're not moving quickly enough. So they're going to put a shoulder to accelerating resourcing and action, commensurate with our climate change challenge, commensurate with our existential need to adapt human systems to the change that's underway. Climate is changing. We're not changing fast enough or at the scale necessary to really succeed as a species, if you will. And to thrive under climate change, humanity faces two urgent imperatives. The first is to sustain and steward an Earth system that provides the conditions necessary for humanity to thrive. So maintaining our natural ecosystems, their critical ecosystem services, uh, natural protections and defenses. And the second is to build the resilience of human systems in agriculture, energy, cities, economies to adapt to the change that's underway and that will continue to take place. And water is vital to both of those endeavors, both of those aims. Water in underpins the product productivity, diversity and distribution of natural ecosystems and their ecosystem services, fundamental to how the Earth system maintains its sustainability and resilience and how the Earth will adapt to climate change. And water sustains and underpins the entirety of the human endeavor, vital to virtually every system. Climate change will most immediately and acutely be represented through water. We're seeing evid evidence of this already in flooding, uh, in drought, uh, in, 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 in a variety of challenges related to shifts in precipitation cycles that have implications for agriculture, for cities, for energy systems. We're seeing many of those dramatic implications already, and we will see climate change most evidently through water. This has been recognized by the Global Commission on Adaptation that I referred to earlier. This commission has the goal of increasing political will, championing bold solutions, commensurate with the scale of our challenge, and accelerating action. And the commission set out seven uh, priority action tracks to accelerate investment in action. Those are in cities, infrastructure, food systems, finance, nature-based solutions, disaster risk reduction and relief, locally led actions, and water. And thanks to the terrific efforts by some of those among us, Hank, Jennifer, Patrick, uh, Betsy with, with WRI, and others who advocated for water, it was in July, just last month, that water was put on the agenda, championed by the Netherlands government and the World Bank. And we have representatives from the Netherlands government here today, Liz and colleague, colleagues who are leading this effort for the Netherlands government who are championing this initiative, saying we must do something about water. It's fundamental to resilience across all sectors. <clears throat> With the World Resources Institute, the Global Center on Adaptation has the honor of managing this, this, this endeavor. And we focus the water action tracks along those two systems that we need to manage, those two imperatives. One, managing an earth system that sustains the conditions necessary for humanity to thrive. So we've set a target of resilience at basin scale from source to sea, addressing the ecological resilience of the natural systems that we must steward to ensure their freshwater productivity and sustainability and resilience. And addressing the critical needs of agriculture, energy, industry, cities, and resolving competing demands. We set an ambitious target which will be further formulated, but initially we've set a target of at least 100 basins managed for resilience by 2030. And obviously we're talking about the critical basins serving the majority of our global population. When it comes to human systems and our interventions to ensure the adaptation and resilience of those critical systems, we've set the target of, of building resilience in cities and in urban water systems, which underpin the well-being of the majority of our population and a rapidly growing population, highly vulnerable to climate change already and increasingly vulnerable, particularly given the growth of cities and the growth of their demands for water 
uh, as the, their economies developed. And we've set the initial ambitious goal of at least 500 cities managed for resilience in their urban water systems by 2030. And we do say at least. This is an ambitious, ambitious target. It's necessary. It's achievable. It's probably not enough. We should do more. So we as a global community, as Patrick also noted, will come together over the next year to, to raise those ambitions even further and raise and mobilize resources to, to achieve them. These are the goals that we've set and we invite the whole of society to contribute to this effort. The Commission is a multidisciplinary or a multi-sectoral body, representatives of government, industry, civil society, local leaders. It takes a, an all of, a, a whole of society effort to address this challenge. <clears throat> That's the framing I, I wanted to offer before launching into discussions of what we're doing. Uh, I'll invite my good friend Suzanne Dorisil, where are you Suzanne, to join us for the keynote. Uh, next slide maybe has her name, there we go. Suzanne is the head of Division for Water, Urban Development and Mobility for the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Uh, her minister is one of the commissioners in the Global Commission on Adaptation, has committed himself personally and, and, the, and the German government uh, as, a, as a nation state to drive this effort. And we're honored to have Suzanne join us today to give some remarks on the role that water will play in that endeavor uh, and the critical leadership by, by Germany in, in this great effort. Please join me, Suzanne. Oh, you weren't mic'd up. Can we get Jennifer a hand? I mean, Su Susanna a hand mic? Okay. Come on up here. They can't see you. Okay. Come up here. So Shall I? Okay. <laughs> some, some more sportive activity today. There's some water. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I have to speak after Fred. <laughs> uh, you're laughing. You know what I'm going to say now because he's very good and making points in a very in a way that everybody understands it, uh, which is not, not something which is a strong side of German development cooperation, I must add. Uh, we have a tendency to yeah, frame it in a kind of complicated manner. And sometimes our minister pushes us to get the message across, not only to our partners, but also to the broader audience. But I was asked to talk um, about cities. And why do I'm particularly pleased to do that here? Because um, there will be a cities track in the climate summit. It's called the ICLA track, uh, abbreviation standing for infrastructure, city and local action. So at the summit, one has recognized the role of cities in, um, in the climate agenda and how to localize climate action and climate finance. Um, there is not yet a specific water angle, but I hope the... It's about resilient infrastructure at large in the whole agenda, but not a specific water angle. But I hear that the Global Commission on Adaptation, which was just presented, is um, kind of proceeding a bit more forcefully on that angle. So, and why is our city important? And uh, because the cities, in cities, the water crisis is already happening. Um, one example, for instance, a bit of a scary example, I must admit, which I encountered in my first few days at the ministry, is that the groundwater table in Dhaka, um, capital of Bangladesh, sinks at a rate of two to three meters a year. The effects are much more uh, pronounced than just for climate change, which is accelerating the effect. We have an institute in Germany that are, is uh, having these data, and I, I must admit I was really scared because there are a few people, I would say, living in that delta. So, and of course, you also know the mega cities of Jakarta uh, and Melilla that are thinking due to groundwater depletion. Um, just recently in the news, the Jakarta city government is, uh, is looking at how to relocate. And um, then we also heard about Chennai in Cape Town already. Um, Chennai, the authorities had to organize trains to bring needed fresh water to the city. And last year, Cape Town became the first city to run out of water. I mean, we had that discussion just uh, uh, this morning. And, but there's also the opposite of scarcity. Uh, the coastal cities of Beira and Mozambique, for instance, were hit by a cyclone. Everybody saw uh, the images and how people were injured 
died and what a dev devastating effect it also had the economy in the city. But we also have seen that there were, um, also from German, but also from other development cooperation organizations, um, infrastructure measures in that area, which actually uh, were not as severely hit and were resilient to some of the cyclones. Probably there's a magnitude that's difficult to be resilient to, but I think we know there's certain magnitudes we can have embed, embedded uh, resilient infrastructure in cities. So donors, donors can help, but we have, should look at three aspects I would like to draw your attention that are interlinked. One is the role of cities I just mentioned in, in resilient future, the finance they need and the ownership of the different actors involved. Uh, urbanization, everybody knows the number, how many people are going to live in cities. Is, uh, is increasing, we identified as one of the mega trends related to water, besides climate change and um, also migration. And the donor spending, which is not enough, everybody knows, um, won't do the trick because there's an estimate, it's a proxy, but still it, it gives an idea that 4.5 trillion of US dollars are needed for urban infrastructure investment across sectors. So the additional finances are needed particularly by cities and cities have to be much more aware how they can tap into finance, be it with donor finance or capital markets. Um, Cape Town is a pioneer. Uh, for instance, we had a development loan of uh, 80 million euros to modernize and expand the city's wastewater treatment. The project will have some impact on mitigation, it will decrease CO2 and methane emission from wastewater treatment. In addition, treated wastewater can be used for irrigation and help to prevent another day zero scenario. What is the most important of that, why I'm mentioning it, the loan didn't go to the, the, uh, the national government but to the city of Cape Town. In 2017, Cape Town has issued a green bond in the size of 1 billion South Africa rand, which is about um, uh, 76 million uh, US dollars, as part of the proceed to cover the installation and replacement of water meters, upgrade of water reservoirs and wastewater treatment. So there's a lot to learn uh, about this example. I'm, I'm very sure that... Um, um, not every country, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, has access to capital markets, but there are other development finance instruments that can help, can help along that way. Or um, as well, of course, we heard about the Green Climate Fund, um, which is financing, and Germany is co contributing substantially to that as well. But um, um, we also see that um, experts uh, convey the message that the risk of water and water risks have to get a bit more into the business community. We heard it a little, we had a couple of sessions here at, uh, uh, at the CV uh, Water Week. Um, I mean not only by um, looking at cooperation but also at looking how, my, how I assess risk as a company for running my business and what would that mean in terms of being more efficient. The, uh, the finance sector may be coming in increasing costs for businesses if they are not efficient with water or don't treat it. I had a big, I had interesting discussion with companies here that are looking mapping now water risk in their countries and how to put more pressure on their suppliers as well to be efficient with water. We had it in, uh, in social standards and hopefully with water risk we can also provide and maybe the rating agencies might look at it in a different way. Uh, there's increasing discussion there as well and that can really kind of tweak the agenda and create a different behavior also for investors. It's a very interesting uh, thing to happen. But we already have some ex uh, successful examples on the ground. Um, together with uh, the British government, we are financing the Natural Resource Stewardship Program, which was formerly called Water Stewardship Program. Um, where it brings together private companies, public authorities and civil societies through this approach around a watershed and they look at the competing uses of water and agree on, on um, activities to overcome the, the water risk uh, related to, to the use of water and how to sustain ecosystems. Um, one example we have is Lusaka and one in Kampala where communities and companies are facing water risk and we help them to develop city water security actions and implementation plans. But it's very vital in these stewardship programs that we have a strong buy-in also by the national governments. 
and that carried these uh, um, uh, cooperation through and make them sustainable. Um, I don't want to spend more time on, on this, but I'm, I said not, not a few examples. What I would be interested in, it's not leading up to the climate summit where Germany is supporting Turkey and Kenya on this ICLA action track on decentralized finance, to hear more, hear from the communities and hopefully some, some local authorities, what in terms would they need in finance or also in capacity building to, uh, um, to, to, to come up with resilient infrastructure plans and how, what would they be the method in prior, prioritizing um, their activities on the ground. So I hope in that discussion we can learn a little. We still have time so we can feed it into debate at the Climate Summit or at the GCA. And we'll have all together to get water bit high on the political agenda. And if you may want to use for it, our new water scarcity clock we launched. Please feel, to do, feel free to do so. Hopefully it wasn't too long for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. That was terrific, Suzanne. Thanks very much, Maggie. Suzanne, you're far too modest. That was great. That's what we call in the U.S. walking the talk. Uh, you've made commitments. You're following those commitments with resourcing to mobilize action. That's what this is all about. You mentioned during your, uh, during your remarks also that the city of Cape Town and the crisis that they faced last year. Before we transition to the fishbowl, we're going to talk about Briefly, or I'm not going to talk about it, you're going to see a video about uh, what Cape Town and, and the response of Cape Town. Um, so as you all know, let me give you some of the details on this. <clears throat> Cape Town, after a, a, a prolonged drought, the officials of the city of Cape Town in January 2008 um, announced that the city of 4 million people um, was three months away from day zero. Day zero, of course, meaning zero water uh, that would, would be provided by the municipal water authorities. And the crisis was narrowly averted thanks to water conservation efforts, reducing consumption by over 50% by the local population, efficient and data-driven management, cutting water allocations to farmers. And still that wasn't enough. Thankfully, Mother Nature intervened. There was rain and we averted, Cape Town averted day zero. The Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative <clears throat> is an effort financed by the uh, Resilience Shift to capture that learning and to share learning to inform future practice in the management of the water system of the city of Cape Town as an underpinning of their resilience. This crisis narrowly averted, as you've seen, by a multitude of actions taken by the government of Cape Town, its, its people, uh, civil society organizations, private sector organizations, to respond to the day zero urgency and to build upon it, to rebuild better, if you will, or to advance beyond the, the vulnerability to a future day zero. Uh, they've developed a, uh, a, an urban water system strategy for resilience, long-term resilience. Uh, supported by some efforts that many of us have contributed to the city water resilience approach, uh, which has been led by Arup, uh, the World Bank, supported by the, the, the Dutch government, uh, the OECD, CWI and others, to develop a comprehensive response to urban system planning for long-term water resilience. Cape Town's not the only city fe uh, facing water challenges, obviously. Um, uh, I had the pleasure earlier this week, and I'm sure many of you did as well, uh, the pleasure to, to see a very bracing uh, presentation by uh, Mr. David Simango, the mayor of Beira, uh, on the, the challenges that they faced uh, in, in the face of a, a tropical uh, cyclone that, that hit Beira. Thankfully, they designed their drainage systems in a manner that mitigated some of the worst parts of that disaster. And thankfully, they weren't facing a high tide, or it might have been a different story altogether. But, but thanks to uh, David's leadership and, 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 and a whole of community response, they're rebuilding. Uh, and also thanks to the efforts of many, including the Dutch government, uh, that have come in to support them hand in hand to, to respond to this. We're going to move now into the fishbowl discussion, featuring many cities that are facing a variety of water-related challenges. I mentioned the city of Beira in Mozambique and, and Mayor um, Simango. David, please stand up so everybody can see you and, 
and, and, and not feel scared to jump in the fishbowl with these folks. I'll, as I introduce you, I'll ask you to stand up. Next to David, we have Jennifer Serra, who's the uh, water lead for the World Bank Group. Uh, Jean Didier Berthaud, who is the, uh, the, uh, uh, a counselor for the Greater Metropolitan Paris uh, and uh, leads their water and sewer, sewer department. Um, next to him, we have Eduardo Vasquez, who leads a, 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 a group called Agua Capital, that's working hand in hand with the government of Mexico City to address their water challenges. Louise Ellis from the Arab team that's piloted the development of the city water resilience approach uh, with eight cities globally. And then lastly, lastly my good friend Ardeep uh, Anand from the city of uh, Miami, the greater Miami and the beaches. Uh, Ardeep leads the water and sewage system for Miami-Dade County. A diversity of, of water related challenges faced by these folks. Um, and we have the pleasure of um, uh, I'm sorry, Alejandro, I forgot your last name. Jimenez. Jimenez. <laughs> Alejandro Jimenez from, uh, from Siwi, uh, who will be our moderator for the fish wall. Please welcome, and, and please don't hesitate to jump in. Alejandro, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, this is going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, first, a little bit of uh, housekeeping, the rules. Uh, we'll try to give first uh, first round of uh, interventions for for all of the, our speakers here. We'll try to keep it to two minutes or so, so try to be brief. Uh, Jennifer will try to help me with the timekeeping somewhere. And then, uh, please, uh, from the other participants, you are either invited to come close to me and perhaps sit at the fishbowl if you want to do any comment or put any question forward or if not if you prefer to stay where you are just ask for the mic and uh, we'll give it to you um, so let's start and then uh, just a quick question for the participants how many lessons were in the video <laughs> mark <laughs> no eight alexa no the Young people are uh, much more into it. Eight lessons. And uh, I will run them through quickly. Expect unpredictability. Collaborate. Information builds trust. Reform governance. Diversify supply. Rethink pricing. Suspend politics. And cities lead. You might have your own lessons. Uh, apart from that, or you might want to reflect uh, on this. So my first question to each of you would be, what must cities do differently to be more water resilient? Hardeep, do you want to start? Sure, let me, <laughs> let me try and jump in. I think I'd like to reflect on uh, uh, you know, the eight lessons because uh, there are permutation combinations within it that you could uh, reform, but the one that bubbles up to the top to me is uh, communications. Uh, I think the value of water is something that we uh, don't emphasize enough, at least in developed countries, because it happens mostly when a disaster strikes. And we said this yesterday when, uh, as we speak today, we are actually watching a hurricane potentially striking uh, the coast of Florida, right? So at that time, we are all very much on our, on our guards, but I think if we are able to take that information conversation from a technical perspective, where water professionals frequently engage in, whether it is cybersecurity type issues, which is a resiliency variable, or aging infrastructure or emerging contaminants, how do you take that technical body of knowledge and communicate to a variety of audiences? When I say variety of audiences, the younger generation, uh, folks who really don't have the time to engage in conversations like these elected officials, uh, regulators, because everyone perceives that information within their own silos. And then ultimately, I think all of these things have to kind of weave together. So for me, authenticity and communications uh, bubble up to the top. Thank you so much for that contribution. Luis, over to you. Um, so we've been working with the city of Cape Town and with Greater Miami and the beaches to um, do some diagnosis um, on their resilience, on their urban water resilience through the city water resilience approach. And um, there are some key similarities actually between, thank you Fred, um, between the challenges that they face. Um, 
One of those that's that's been highlighted is the need for um, long-term planning um, around resilience and a long-term strategy, uh, with a focus both on, on, as Patrick said earlier, adaptation and mitigation, um, and enabling them really to make the case um, for investment in resilience, especially um, when it can also often be seen as uh, at, in opposition um, to their uh, business as usual challenges that they face. Um, in a similar in a similar vein. Uh, in the area of governance, the need for effective um, coordination between the upstream stakeholders, um, whether it's through catchment groups or water management districts, um, there's certainly challenges um, between co um, collaboration, coordination, communication between the different levels of government and also the different sectors, um, energy, water, food, agriculture. Uh, and then the final one that I think um, I'd like to highlight is around uh, accessibility of data and also the capacity to um, analyze data so that we have truly data driven decisions um, both at all levels of government um, and to ensure in both times of disaster and in times of long-term planning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alejandro. Eduardo, over to you. Thank you Alejandro, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, what can cities uh, do differently? I think if we're speaking about unpredictability, we're speaking about climate change effects, certainly it comes into prevention. Uh, we are operating generally in terms of reaction when the disaster strikes. The laureate of the Water Prize was outlining this issue quite clearly in the inauguration speech. Uh, usually cities, uh, stakeholders in a given watershed or city react when, the, when day zero is uh, 48 hours away. So nowadays we know that climate change is affecting water availability, water quality in different spaces across the globe. So it is a moment to prepare ourselves in terms of governance, in terms of uh, public policy, in terms of financing, in terms of communications, to be aware, to create a sense of urgency among different stakeholders, not only public, of course, international organizations, grassroots organizations, to understand both the problem that the climate change poses towards water availability, and on the other hand, what are the, the importance of the efficient use of waters within uh, of the water within the city? If we don't have this sense of uh, urgency in the, the different spaces, then the problem will come along again. And in 12 months, we will be speaking not about Cape Town or Mexico City or Paris or Miami. We will be speaking of, of another city. We had the crisis in Chennai a month ago. So it comes along in different spaces, in different moments, but if we don't focus on prevention, and of course, and this is something that we welcome a lot, uh, into local action. This is why it's so important, the Commission focusing in watersheds and in cities, of course in communities, uh, can make a big difference. Thank you so much. I hope you are starting to think what are going to be your contributions, you outside the fishbowl, because uh, it's, they are very good points that uh, require some further questions here. What about you, Jan Didier? What do you think cities must do differently? Yeah, uh, perhaps I, I could uh, I could notice something specific for for uh, for Paris to accelerate uh, urban uh, water resilience, uh, which is that we are going to welcome uh, Olympic Games in 2024. So uh, it's probably a good reason to accelerate to get results and uh, to make evaluations of the results because it's one of the major topics now that uh, everybody shares. Uh, the actions, but we have to we have to um, make uh, really a, an effort to, to to get the results now and uh, and for evaluation. So that's why we have joined um, with uh, Greater Paris Sanitation Authority and Greater Paris Metropolitan Authority. We have joined uh, IWA Water Rights Principles uh, that were very close from the lessons from uh, Cape Town and uh, I would like perhaps to notice uh, five uh, five building blocks uh, for uh, to, to deliver uh, sustainable uh, uh, urban water uh, first about uh, vision uh, 
uh, and we it's a, it's a, it's necessity to to, to share uh, a vision including water and in, uh, it, that enables people to work together at uh, different scales and uh, across uh, disciplines. Uh, second, uh, governance uh, obviously and uh, policies provide incentives for uh, urban stakeholders. Uh, third, about knowledge and uh, and capacities to 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 fully uh, realize the the vision and the increased uh, capacities and competencies. Um, fourth, planning tools, uh, asset management, uh, master plans, uh, decision support systems, uh, every tools we can uh, we can implement. And and the last one, obviously, implementation tools and uh, and the problem of uh, financial tools. So uh, we really have to deal with uh, every stakeholders uh, to uh, to achieve uh, to achieve these goals, it's, uh, and uh, specifically in in Paris uh, because of uh, the low pressure of uh, of the river. So we have a, a a big challenge for that. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Over to you. Um, no, and thank you, and thank you for being here again. And uh, this is the third year. And every year we have more and more cities coming. You know, we start off with Mexico, and then we have Paris, and we have Cape Town. So the crisis is there. Um, and the good news is our job is, in addition to supporting cities and financing, is to learn from the cities and to take the lessons. Um, and we always say it's really getting back also a lot to the basics, right? We say uh, it's about demand side management, and it's about supply and hedging the risks. And on the demand side, I mean, a lot of this is fixing the leaks in the cities, in the water systems in the cities, not just the technical leaks and the holes in the pipes and the 50% of water that's lost, the leaks in the utility. Um, it's looking also at uh, fixing the prices and making sure that uh, the, the, the real cost of water is paid for and there's smart s subsidies for those who need it. Um, and it's also about conservation and talking to people. So there's a whole bunch of things we can do in cities on demand side management and have quick gains very quickly. But then we're looking at diversifying the supplies. How do you hedge risks? Um, and here, this is interesting because that takes you outside of the city. It makes you go and talk to people. It makes you talk to uh, upstream in the watershed. A lot of times it's the agriculture sector. And then it starts making you look at the efficiency of the use of the agriculture water. It look, makes you look at the pollution loads that's coming into the river upstream. But it also thinks about wastewater reuse and downstream. And how can you work with the industry in the city? How can you retreat the water and use it for industrial processes? How do you generate new supply? Um, and also through nature-based solutions. The whole thing, which is about land use planning, rainwater harvesting. We heard the minister from India talk about rainwater harvesting, uh, groundwater recharge. So there's a whole slew now of supply options that are not just in the city, but it really brings people from outside the city. But the lesson, one lesson that we're learning a lot is this is an iterative process. And in Sao Paulo, they were so good at demand side management of raising the prices and people cutting their consumption that all of a sudden Sabespi, the water utility, had financial difficulties. So there is this iterative process of what are we learning and what are the impacts. So I think that's one of the big lessons. This is not a one time the crisis is over, let's go. So it's an iterative process of what we learn and the city has to keep on working on it. And how then do you get ahead of the curve? And I agree with Paris and other cities we need to get at many, many cities, help them get ahead of the curve so they don't have to be doing this in a crisis mode. Mm. Um, and then finally, I think the two points I want to add is data, data, data. Data is really, really important because a lot, you can't manage water. You can't communicate with people if you don't have access to the data. And if you want to share water and reallocate water, you need to good data. And the plea that I have for everyone, and I just came from the private sector lunch, uh, breakfast, <laughs> is about KPIs. If we want to have a global agenda on adaptation in cities, what are the indicators? What are the two or three indicators that we can work to say, what is a resilient city? Well, water resilient city, but we have a couple indicators that people can jump on and ascribe to. And I think that's something I, it would be really, really important for us to all own and have. Thank you. Thank you. How much things you cover in two minutes? Next, next time I'll give you 30 seconds, <laughs> my God. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Simango. Yes, I'd like to come a little bit with what we are living in. For me, what is very important in this lesson is a city for all, inclusive, stakeholders, uh, planning, and finance engineering. I think that is very important because if you have the good planning, you can prevent. And I have my own experience. Uh, when we had the cyclone 14 March, 
it was just six months after inaugurating the new drainage system. So it means that we did our master plan and the master plan was well planned. We thought that it was very important for the city to have the drainage system. Far away of imagining that we could have a cyclone like that. But we are used to flooding. That's why we planned the drainage system to prevent ourselves flooding. So planning for me and finance engineering are keynotes very important and especially working with the stakeholders involve everyone in the process, make it so inclusive. So that's how we prepared our master plan for the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we started with eight lessons and I think you put together like 25 more. <laughs> uh, while you think your questions, uh, I mean, some things that I have been repeated a couple of times, the whole uh, communication, uh, sense of urgency, local action, long-term planning, coordination upstream, downstream and across sectors, prevention. Now I can't hear any more. Um, sorry. Yeah. I started here in the other sessions. Uh, it was very difficult, sorry. Um, <laughs> planning tools, implementation tools, managing demand leaks, but also not, not only leaks in the system, leaks in the utilities, talking to the people, thinking about pollution, efficiency, wastewater reuse, nature-based solutions, and all that in an iterative process. Not bad, <laughs> not bad. What all this uh, suggests to you, or to you, uh, if we don't get uh, any participant here willing to say something. Yes, please. I need a microphone here. Are you supposed to ah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Victoria Granström. I work for um, IKEA Sweden. And my question is, because uh, we're customers, we have 400 million customers only in high and extremely high water stressed areas out of the 52 countries. And one of the question is, because we know about the water appliances and the water efficiency schemes that are available on a global level. And Singapore and Australia have the absolute strictest ones. And how are the other countries working on the water efficiency schemes for appliances, taps and showers, and all the activities that private customers are using at home? Thank you for that. Uh, very good example of a question. Introduce yourself, concrete question, and uh, over to you now. Right. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Welteji. I'm working with the WHO in Ethiopia and then uh, in some countries. So my first question goes to, uh, the, to colleagues from Mozambique. I was in Bera for the uh, cycle of response, including the cholera outbreak. Okay. Uh, uh, by profession, I'm an environmental health professional working with the WHO. I undertook uh, the risk assessment for the cholera. You have mentioned you inaugurated the drainage system. So I have the picture of the open drainage in Bera. So uh, th that are, uh, uh, I have even with my mobile, that is the main problem uh, for the cholera outbreak. Uh, which uh, because of the cyclone and uh, the drainage was one of the factors. But the good thing uh, in Mozambique is uh, the water treatment system of uh, Bera was not damaged. I, have, uh, I did the risk assessment in the water treatment planet and also in the uh, reservoir. The reservoir and then the water treatment planet was not damaged by the cyclone because the infrastructure was uh, resilient to that level. But the problem is uh, the water supply coverage of that town is only 6-0%. From the very beginning, the coverage is less. And then uh, the effect was uh, on the network. The network is not resilient, but uh, the reservoir and the treatment planet was, uh, uh, is re uh, resilient. But I'm, I'm wondering about the drainage, and uh, I have... Uh, um, in the drainage, even the pipeline is passing through open drainage and uh, it with the contaminated waste, and uh, those are the factors. So I would like to know uh, in detail about the drainage, and also I would like to highlight uh, the resilience of the water supply system in that town. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think to the right. Did you want to come uh, close to the fishbowl and interact with the distinguished guests? 
please do. Yeah. My name is Ulrike Pokorski from GIZ, and my question is around communication. I think the example of Beira is very special in that there has really been an investment towards resilience and then really shortly after the disaster, disaster struck. So what we often do not take into account or people, decision makers don't into, take into account is the cost of not doing anything, the, the, the cost of non-adaptation. So I'm wondering whether anyone did the calculation what it would have cost in Beira if this drainage system had not been built? And then how can we communicate this better? Because I think this can be a good example to communicate the economic value of such adaptation efforts. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'll give now the word to our guests to respond. Uh, yeah. Mayor Simango, you have been directly yeah. <laughs> asked a couple okay. of questions. I'll start with the first person. Thank you for being with us and supporting the city of Beira. Regarding to the cholera, let me come back to it. Uh, we had the cyclone, we had the neighbor district. But the big problem was not inside the city. The problem was the neighbor district where there was no system. We had flooding in Buzi, we had flooding in Yamatanda, we had flooding in Dondo. Those are neighbor districts. And in fact, there they died 700 people because of flooding. But inside the city, we didn't have case of death because of the flooding, but the system was working perfectly. We had the rotation basin, which is a new system. We could manage retain the bus and when the waves went down, we opened all the gate and the water went out. So the diseases came exactly from outside because we were moving people from the district to, to Beira because it was the safer place, but people were coming with their own diseases. So that's what we had cholera. We had about 4,700 cases of cholera, but inside the city, we only had about one death of cholera. So it means that the system is perfectly. And regarding of planning, my dear uh, people in Mozambique say that what could happen in Beira without the drainage system? If we could have flooding uh, cyclone during high tide, we could have about two to five meters of flooding and the city could go. But we had about two meters, less than two meters. The system could retain the water. We didn't have any case of death because of flooding inside the city. But years before the system, we could have death in the city. So definitely, it's very important to plan. You save money, and we did save money. We did the project of master plan of the dash. We did the, the, the drainage system of the World Bank. And now we are going to the second phase of the World Bank of the drainage system. The dash is also in. So it means that definitely Bear needs the drainage net working so that we can save more lives. Thank you. Uh, I would like also contributions to the communication and the and the if someone has done the costing of uh, the non-action as well as uh, the measures in place for the private uh, for the households for the private users uh, that was the first question i wanted to reflect a little on um, okay. the question of the cost of inaction um, and i'd like to integrate what you said with respect to planning and data and kpis and the takeaway for me is, you know, I manage a very large capital improvement program uh, in Miami. And uh, one of the things that we've learned, at least, is we t typically tend to price projects based on labor, equipment, and materials. And I think we've got to shift that prioritization process based on risk, of course, but based on the triple bottom line of social, economic, and environmental costs, right? So when you integrate the two, labor, equipment, materials, and the triple bottom line approach on the life cycle cost of a project and its impact on social, economic, and environmental, then I think you're able to take the two of them and make some sort of priorities that are more visible to the community, the folks in finance, the folks from elected officials who are making decisions because there's a direct relation 
uh, to to uh, to community. Frequently, we become victims of looking at it in a very engineering way, where we are looking at projects as projects. So I think if you're able to integrate our planning processes based on those, I think that cost of inaction uh, becomes very visible, right? Because now you're elevating these conversations to the top. The communications aspect, I think, you know, the gentleman talked about uh, lives lost to um, uh, cholera. And uh, some of the factoids we've all read is more lives are lost to waterborne diseases than lives lost to war. And then the question then that becomes very relevant to the top is, why is there still a lack of urgency? Where is the immunity or the lack of urgency? What more needs to be done to bring and elevate the lack of, emerg of urgency, right? So it goes back to communications. So I think, you know, if you're able to take technical conversations, the, the emotional connection is where we don't probably do a good job on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think after this conference, after this event is over, uh, I think the challenge to all of us is to, to become those stewards and ambassadors of these conversations in our own communities, because I think the spheres of influence are at the community level. They all bubble up to the top eventually at a decision-making level. Um, and I think that is where more grassroots action within those spheres of influence needs to be done. And finally, I think we need to settle on a common definition of resilience. Um, once we settle on that common definition of resilience, uh, whether it's the shock and stresses approach or whether it is recovering, recovering, restoring, uh, rebounding after in the aftermath of a storm or a disruptor, all of those elements need to be there because I think both the community, the ratepayers, the taxpayers want some sort of accountability from, from the folks who are at the helm of affairs in managing resilience. And that accountability is about how have we improved resilience from one year to another year to another year. So if 10 years have passed and if we are still talking about how can we be resilient, then I think there is something amiss. And if we, start, if we start settling down on the definition of resilience, build it into our local codes, enforce, I hate to use the word enforce, but I would say enforce because it is urgency we talked about. And unless you enforce it, anything that is voluntary is not going to yield the results. Um, so, you know, they are, these are hard conversations. Uh, enforcement becomes, there needs to be leadership and a political will behind it. And, and, and I think that will ultimately translate to results. So I think that was, those would be some of my thoughts there. Thank you. More comments here from, the, from inside, Luis and Eduardo. And then I'll go outside again. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I'd just like to build on one of, one of Hardeep's um, points. I, I totally agree that we need to be looking at um, uh, resilience investments across the, the triple bottom line and, and taking the multiple capitals approach so that we're getting the full benefit of the investment or, or certainly uh, measuring the full benefit of the resilience investments that are in place. There are also other tools that we need to look at, things like the resilience dividend, um, we mentioned avoided costs, dated reveal preference are all opportunities we have to um, really uh, ensure that we are communicating and um, taking uh, account of the total value of what we're doing in the resilience space. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. I want to build on the hard discussions topic, uh, which certainly reflect themselves in hard decisions. And uh, I also want to underline the importance of involving these discussions and hard decisions with other st sectors and key stakeholders. So it's not about the water box. It's not the environmental realm. We have to be discussing these topics with the finance ministries, with the social development ministries, with the commercial ministries, with the education ministries, with the health ministries to demonstrate the cost of inaction. So if we invest one dollar in uh, these kind of projects, how many lives are we going to save, for instance, if a flood comes along? How many dollars are we going to save that we need, do not need to invest if a re uh, disaster comes along? How many dollars are we going to save or how the development of any given space, country, watershed is going to be affected if we invest this project in these projects and children are able to go to school? So uh, it's so important to jump into that realm so that the, uh, we garner the support of different champions uh, across different sectors uh, uh, with different thematics and viewpoints. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to get into those hard discussions or uh, present solutions such as in Mozambique. 
So. Good. Jennifer, Fred, someone wanted to come here. Saying, and I, I've been thinking about the theme of the conference this week, which is really universal access in the last mile. So a lot of the measures uh, are taking about resilience and fixing utilities and fixing leaks and making sure the system's more efficient allows you also to deliver services and expand coverage in the city in a more efficient way. And also on the wastewater treatment and what you're saying on drainage. I mean, so many cities across the world, they don't have sanitation, they don't have wastewater drainage. So you can also, it's not just resilience. Uh, because of climate change and adaptation. But this is also going back to the very basic SDGs. And I think that's another selling point uh, when we want to make a case for investing in this. Indeed, and that leads to how cities can engage with the global agenda and are engaging. John Didier. No, ju just a few words about not the cost of inaction, but perhaps the communication around the cost of action. Because uh, sometimes, you know, uh, in, in, in cities, uh, in developed cities, and uh, especially in Paris, we have to organize the high quality of water. So to reach the best quality of water, you have to invest a lot. And when you have invested a lot, uh, most of the time, you have a rise of uh, the price of water. And after, so you have um, a certain level of uh, the price of water which is acceptable for the population. So we have to deal with that. So how to invest, how much to invest, what, what exactly we want to reach uh, about our goals and after how to communicate uh, with the population. That's what uh, the difference we. Any point? Uh, uh, I'd actually like to, to ask the group a question. I um, come from the city of, of New York, which as you all know, um, suffered through Superstorm Sandy. Is this, is this working? Yeah, it's waking. Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, a question for the for the mayors, for my friends. Um, I come from the city of New York that experienced Superstorm Sandy in 2013. Prior to Superstorm Sandy, New York New York never talked about resilience, never thought about the, that that magnitude of threat. Uh, I would actually say it's it's waning now. That 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 was 2013, and we're in 2019. I wonder uh, if you are seeing from your mayor peers awareness, interest in the issue of urban water system resilience in climate change adaptation, or to Jennifer's point, resilience to global uh, environmental and social change more broadly. Is there demand out there? That's question number one. And secondly, are the tools available to respond to those future crises? Do you have the tools at your disposal to anticipate, anticipate and plan for those urgencies? And if you do, tell, tell us all what you found most useful. Thank you. Keep your answers, because I want to give a couple of authors to, to speak. Please. I know this was going to happen. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> um, I would like to make a, a contribution towards the video about Cape Town, okay. which uh, I'm sorry to say uh, is lacking in some balance. However, <coughs> We just heard that national governments need to be in involved in the planning for any mayor to do something properly. You've said it, you've said it just now that Minister of Finance, Minister of um, Corporation, everybody needs to be able to, to support the city as it goes through a crisis. That was a, a um, arguably inept way sometimes from the South African national government related to any water issues in, in Cape Town. But other than just the scare tactics that were exposed in this video of saying ground zero is around the corner, you must save. And I live in Johannesburg, so visiting Cape Town was a real expedition because you were confined to two minute showers after a day of work and things like that. It wasn't pleasant to visit the city. Uh, the city had, I think, 12, 12 to 20 percent um, cancellation in tourism bookings and things like that. And one thing that the national government thought of doing is while there is the the scare tactic of the Grand Zero was also to give hope, especially to those who are not uh, in a deeply divided city, uh, accessed by the campaigns. Because, um, you know, television stations were not there, or very limited, and things like that. And those who, who, and that happened to be also those areas who are less uh, prodigious in their consumption of water. They, they were the poor areas. So that's the first option. So why was the national government not uh, consulted in a contribution towards this video? 
as it, as it is meant to be one of the enabling agencies in any crisis of a resilient uh, city. And then the second thing, just as a matter of information, one of the sponsors to this video has a competitor who I worked with because we, we uh, wanted to bring the Grand Prix for Africa to Cape Town, so we had to do a lot of environmental impact. And the city had, since 2012, uh, from this highly respected consulting company, an extensive planning and assessment of what the the city has in water uh, requirements and how it could manage that. And then the last thing is just to support Jennifer. Um, our ministry will go and digitize title deeds as much as any of the dams that Southern Africa has in order to, to deal with the data through sovereign data management uh, because without that you cannot manage or pretend to be able to find the solution that are sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a contribu contribution from the Ministry of uh, Human Settlement of South Africa, right? Thank you. There, please. Come in, please. Yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Alexa Bruce. I'm a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, so my question is in relation to if we recognize that resilience is a process and not an end destination and that we need to be inclusive and collaborate with, you know, across ministries and different stakeholders. Um, my question is how do we reconcile the time it takes to build trust uh, and buy in into the process um, and typically in also in particularly in conditions where we're not in crisis, with the urgency of the task at hand to achieve the 500 cities and the 100 basins that we want to embed resilience in by 2030. And just perspectives on that point. Very good point. Uh, and then also remember the questions asked by Fred. This is probably your last intervention, if you have something to say in terms of time. I think, uh, no, 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 now it's for the speakers, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, j just to answer to, to her point, I think you have to build social pressure. Uh, how do you do that? With communications. This sense of urgency among citizens, it's not only citizens, again, it's key stakeholders at the okay. top and at the bottom, at the bottom and the top. So w you really have to make the entourage aware of the problems that we are facing and the costs of action and, and inaction. So uh, that social pressure paired to strategies of information, of transparency, of KPIs, then you will create uh, more enabling conditions to move along these hard discussions and decisions uh, in many ways and to create, create the proper incentives for decision makers. Great. The, I, I've been told we have uh, still eight, nine minutes. So, I mean, it's not as, as uh, pressured as I thought. Uh, Fred also asked, I mean, the time for reconcil... I mean, Alexa made the, the point of the time for reconciling the urgency versus building the political social commitment. I think that's a valid point. Do we have the tools that we need? How do we use them? What's lacking? Um, please, a few reflections while we gather more questions. So I think from a tools from a tool standpoint, at least from from where I work, I think we've got a lot of tools. Sometimes we become victims of too many tools, right? <laughs> and and then decluttering which of the tools in the toolbox you have to use sometimes becomes a challenge of its own. And uh, uh, but coming back to tools, I think going back to Alexa's question on um, how do you reconcile trust. I think credibility is something that you build over time, obviously. Credibility is over, is over time. The, the, the challenge we face is our, our planning horizons are 25 years, 50 years, and 100 years, right? Our political horizons are two years, four years. Um, so the choice is either we make our political horizons forever, right? Which I don't think uh, we wanted to go there. Um, the challenge is how do we keep those conversations when you create master plans, which are 20-year plans, drive the five-year plans, drive the one-year plan, the annual budgets. How are those planning conversations going to be sustainable over time because they need to be funded over time? 
And therefore, that question of integrity and authenticity and communications and credibility all kinds kind of gets built into that planning process. And if that planning process is inclusive, we saw that in the video from a standpoint of community input, I think those planning tools should be something that the community should own rather than the government owning it or rather than the engineers owning it. So if that plan is owned by the community, then I think it will be shepherded over time automatically through the finance process because it is something that's going to be sustainable and I think that would build credibility because as Jennifer said, those planning elements will have KPIs built into it, backed up by sound data. Data should have integrity in it. And I think it's, it's one whole circle of ecosystems where all these variables have to work in harmony. And resilience is only, you know, as you're as strong as the weakest link in the chain. And if any one of those chains or variables are shot, if your data is shot, it's garbage and garbage out. So then the credibility element gets suffering, suffered again, right? So I think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of us identifying the toolbox, but the community playing a very major role in the planning process. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, if I take Fred and Alexis um, first. Um, so Fred's first part around, um, are we seeing a kind of uh, an, an understanding that there are resilience challenges out there from cities? Um, I know through, from the 100 Resilient Cities program, they've identified that their cities, 80% of their cities have identified um, that they face water challenges and recognize that uh, they need to um, respond to those challenges. And we're also beginning to see some uh, legislative uh, drivers for uh, considering resilience, um, particularly um, for water utilities, both public and private, in the US with the American um, Infrastructure Act and in the UK with the Water Industry Act, which are encouraging um, uh, water companies to certainly consider uh, the, the resilience of their systems and the resilience of their planning. Um, to Fred's, the second part of his question is, are the tools available? And it, it slightly dovetails with Alexa's question there. Um, I think there are, there are tools available. Um, the City Water Resilience Approach is one that we've been um, developing for the last three years with a, a number of very strong partners in the area, including the Rockefeller Foundation, Resilient Shift, the World Bank, etc. Um, and I think it brings uh, an element that could could certainly assist, certainly not solve, but as, assist the, the problem that Alexa brings. And uh, the city, the premise of it is that it's multi-stakeholder. It involves um, communities. It brings them into the to the discussion right from the outset, so they have a shared understanding of the resilience challenges facing the city, and and move through to develop a collective action plan. Um, and I think by having that transparency and having that buy-in um, right from the start, um, you can begin to build that trust and, uh, and, and therefore be able to uh, move forward um, with the resilience concepts and resilience plans. Um, to the question from the, from the gentleman from South Africa, um, uh, I'm not responsible for the, for the drought learning initiative, um, for the drought learning initiative project. Um, I work on a separate project with the city of Cape Town, um, but I am very happy to uh, have a chat with him afterwards and put him in contact with, the, with those guys. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me give uh, one uh, contribution from the outside of Is the fish pond. Brilliant. Yes, um, it is. My name is Eleanor Earl and I work at the Resilience Shift. Um, it's so exciting to hear such rich conversations about city resilience um, and particularly water resilience at this conference. And um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, breaking down the silos. So one of the biggest challenges that we're facing both within water infrastructure and across critical infrastructure is that the silos within and between these systems hasn't broken down. Um, and we believe that the that working across the value chain, as we like to call it, the resilience shift is really important for delivering both water resilience, but resilience for all infrastructure. And I wanted to ask how the cities that are being represented here and other other cities are working to deliver this. Thank you. Thank you. Some comments about this, please. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your question. Um, Perhaps I can give you a, a precise example of uh, what we made with uh, sanitation into the uh, era of uh, the circular economy because it's uh, our goal to, to lead sanitation into the era of uh, circular economy. And um, you have um, uh, a, big, uh, a big project uh, with um, uh, the Greater Paris, uh, Greater Paris West Treatment uh, Authority. And so uh, we're going to, to uh, organize a multi-sectoral partnership uh, to, to recycle uh, organic uh, inputs in treatment plants. 
uh, and uh, organic household waste. So uh, we, can, uh, we can use both to produce energy. And I think it's a good example of uh, what we could make uh, between a uh, wastewater treatment plant and a uh, waste treatment uh, for a uh, household. Maybe also, I, we have a really nice program uh, called the 2030 Water Resource Group, which is a partnership um, and with the public sector, the private sector. And its objective is really to create these multi-stakeholder platforms uh, to address water issues. And the platforms are formed um, around problems that are identified, and everyone comes around the table to share solutions. And they find out what is the solution, and can we share water? So there's a very, very concrete examples in Lima, uh, where the water utility can work with industry and the mining companies, how they can recycle water. Again, this idea of the circular economy of water. Whereas in Bangladesh, also, where you have to where policy gets in the way. And then, then when do you bring in government because you need a policy reform? Or where do you need bigger investment? And I think keep on having these types of platforms that bring multi-sector um, stakeholders together within the city, outside the city. And it has to be around a watershed or around a city. And I think that's what we're learning. It's not around an industry, but really what is the focus that we're trying to do? And it is galvanizing around the water basin, or it could be the city, or it could be out in, in an agriculture area and upstream. So I think that's what we're trying to move towards. Um, and I come back to KPIs and data because that's what really allows people to work together and, and, and have a, a vision and be able to measure uh, their, their targets and their objectives. Great. I can add well, just a quick, yes. quick comment to the breaking of the silos. I think, you know, the we tend to look at water. We've given the different names, water, wastewater, storm water, reclaimed water, groundwater, um, ocean waters. But it's if you follow the drop of water through the water cycle, it's one water, right? And I think the City Water Resilience Framework um, has helped in many ways in forcing the conversation of breaking down the silos from two aspects. One, from a standpoint of governance, because you have all the different entities looking at different names of water, water waste, water storm water. So it breaks that down and it brings you, it forces you together to come together from a governance standpoint. You look at it from the one water lens. And the other aspect is on data. Each of these different stakeholders managing different forms of water have their own forms of data. So you're able to somehow find a way to standardize those data, bring them together. What we all know today is big data. And then, of course, there's, there's a whole lot of conversations behind it on artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, tools like those will slowly start propelling the conversations in breaking those silos down, as long as we are consistent and persistent with those tools. Great. Uh, thank you. I think there was a contribution by Susan, right? Uh, yeah, thank you. I just have a question um, on... Um, uh, was Fred asked? I'm not sure what that was answered to the mayor from Beira. Um, and breaking down silos, I'm all happy if we do that. But I, I get a bit the impression here that we knew from the audience we need more toolbox, we need more multi-stakeholder partnerships. All right, but probably I think we do know how infrastructure is being built already, looking at countries where they have infrastructure. So I think we can do already quite a lot. And also Beira has shown that it has worked. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm just being a bit, you know, frightened. We, we need a speed and probably can do already quite a lot. Thank you. On the existing toolbox, but my question to him was, what we need is a political push from the national level to put the resources there. And so my question was, um, a bit like Fred, your peers, but also the national government, how do they react to the crisis after... You know, they had some time to reflect. Did Barra show that other cities are to follow? But was there a learning process within the government that, I mean, helps them later on to implement similar resilience? David, you have the final word, actually, of the fishbowl, and you have like 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. You know, we as mayors, we mustn't wait for the central government to achieve our goals. We need to do what the people need to live. Uh, we have done our master plan, which is working perfectly. We need to adapt it because we had the, uh, now the cyclone. We need to see how, how far we did. But we are happy because we've been involved with all stakeholders in the city. It was very inclusive. So we are in the right way. And what is happening now is people asking me, wow, what could happen if we couldn't have that system working? But when we are doing the infrastructures, everybody was complaining. 
<laughs> but you know, that, that's the thing. And what we did now says, okay, because people used to say, ah, let's put rubbish in the, in, in the channels, make it dirty. But now it says, okay, let's bring those small boats. Let's come with sport in the channels. So everybody said, no, don't put, that, don't put it, anything there because this is a sport river. So I think that the, the most important is communication. We had death in the district areas. Why? Because people didn't have any information that Cyclone was arriving. The government was supposed to say, okay, this is a, a risk area. Let's take these people out from this area. Nothing was done like that. I have my grandmother leaving those areas. And she told me, we saw water coming. Ah, it's water. We saw water coming. It's water. The end of the day, they were underwater. So nobody was really ha having a real knowledge what was happening. So definitely planning and engineering. I'm happy that we have the World Bank here. We have the Dutch. They are supporting us. We have the Dutch team in the ground. The World Bank is doing so hard. So thanks all of you. Thank you very much. And uh, while I get kicked out here, I would add my two cents in terms of uh, has been repeated uh, communication, stakeholder participation, inclusiveness from our own uh, experience, building uh, the accountability mechanisms that would help uh, survive different political uh, moments is crucial because resilience is a long-term investment and an imperative now. So I think we, we really have to to work on collective action and make it a long-term process. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you to all of you. And I'll pass over to Fred for the, before the clo final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, um, mayors, colleagues. That was excellent. Really, truly excellent. Um, much appreciated. Oh, I'm losing my sound. Um, we, uh, ladies and gentlemen, have a high honor in that represented in this room, we have leaders from India, Colombia, Ethiopia, South Africa, the Netherlands, Germany, Chile, of course, Sweden, uh, public actors, private uh, entities, civil society entities, including the World Bank, uh, Arab, IKEA, IMI, uh, TNC, um, WRI, WWF, who have all, are all joining together to respond to this urgent, urgent need. Uh, as I presented at the beginning of my talk and, and my colleague Patrick presented at the end of the last session, last year Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates, and Kristalina Georgieva launched a movement to accelerate action, to accelerate resourcing, and to address the, the climate challenges that we face. We encourage all of you who are not presently members to join us. Uh, Jose Luis, bring Colombia on board. Uh, I next have the high honor of uh, introducing uh, the Deputy Minister of Sweden, Isabella Lovin. Isabella, we encourage uh, the government of Sweden as well to come on board with us uh, to support this global movement, to take action, uh, to respond to these challenges that we know are coming, we can anticipate and plan for and manage for. Uh, thank you all for this excellent session. And, and Isabella, if you would honor us with the, with the closing keynote. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for inviting me to speak and to give uh, concluding remarks. I'm really uh, um, sad to say that I didn't follow all of the discussion uh, earlier on because I was at the cabinet meeting, also presenting the enormous importance of preserving biolo biological diversity and the loss of biological diversity and the connection between that and the loss of ecosystem services, uh, which is a very, very important topic uh, for, for the world. Uh, we're going to approach the CBD in, in China next year and we will have to set new targets. But we also have the concept conversation in, in New York uh, in now in September on uh, nature-based solutions and how that can contribute actually to reducing emissions and uh, having a possibility of actually uh, living up to the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree target. And of course, water comes into all of this in a, in a very, very uh, concrete way. 
climate change, we know it's happening here and now. And uh, the uh, are we getting? Okay, it's a bit of a new experience not to hear yourself in the in the speakers. But okay, good, you're hearing me now. So uh, climate change is is happening here and uh, now, and we see the effects around the globe, very much connected also to water. It's water shortage, it's uh, droughts, but also floodings. It's like the two sides of the same coin. Uh, and this also uh, gives us a, a very big challenge and also maybe a possibility. How can we adapt our way of living to build a resilient future also through uh, sustainable water management? Adaptation to climate change is to a large extent uh, about managing water. Too little water or too much water. Um, climate change is very much uh, something that affects the whole water cycle of our planet. We're having uh, melting ice caps, we're having sea level rise, we're having droughts, we're having extreme uh, torrential rains and, and water uh, falls. Um, so this is something that uh, really um, is very evident that we are affected in many ways uh, and it's also very much connected to water. The last few summers, Sweden has experienced uh, drought. This has absolutely never ever happened before. Uh, so almost all the Swedish communes have extremely low uh, water levels in our groundwater. And uh, a few of them has uh, really been forced to, to have a, a ban on um, and also uh, on irrigation and, and so on. So this is a new situation for Sweden. Last year we also had the most extensive forest fires ever uh, happening in Scandinavia. We were, as you may know, uh, forced to ask help from the European Union and our neighboring countries because we didn't actually have the uh, extinction uh, capacity to, to, uh, to manage these forest fires. And we, do, we need to do a lot to also capture uh, the rainfalls and, and make sure that we have enough groundwater and water in, in the soil to, to really prevent these extreme and dangerous events from happening. Globally, we know that wetlands are disappearing. Over the last century, we lost uh, some 70% of natural wetland areas in the world. The wetland losses have serious implications, not only for biodiversity, uh, also for livelihoods and water security, but also uh, for the ability of the soil to store carbon. By restoring and conserving and wisely using our wetlands, we can take important steps towards uh, both achieving the Paris Agreement, but also, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. Sweden um, invests now a lot in trying to uh, uh, restore and in some cases also construct new wetlands. These wetlands will have a great importance to our climate adaptation and also the management of the quality of uh, and the quantity of water. Also, uh, it's an important uh, um, tool for flood protection and also, of course, to increase biodiversity. So this investment is really a win-win-win uh, investment. Sweden also has taken a lot of measures and we're continuing to do that to adapt our cities and our societies to cl changing climate. The government had recently adopted a national strategy for adaptation to climate change to reduce our vulnerabilities. Locally, several Swedish cities are now successfully using nature-based solutions against floodings in cities. For example, by building open ecological surface water management solutions for, for stormwater. And we're also very much encouraging uh, green rooftops and, and open green areas that can absorb uh, the uh, rainfall when we have extreme uh, rain uh, events. 
And here in Stockholm, you may have seen, well, first of all, it's a city surrounded by water, but work is going on in the very city center uh, to adapt to climate change. On your way to the city, you will pass Slussen, which is a big lock in the center of Stockholm between Lake Mälaren and the Baltic Sea. And uh, I think it's difficult to miss the huge construction work going on there and around the water. This is an example of adaptation to climate change made to prepare for increasing rain, runoff and floods, and uh, as well as to increase the capacity for drain from Lake Mälaren to the Baltic Sea. Through this effort, the risk of flooding in and around Stockholm will decrease notably. And it's really a, a very necessary um, measure that we have to take. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, to reach the climate agreement and the goals within the 2030 agenda, a new way of managing water is needed to make societies more resilient, sustainable and inclusive. Climate change, growing populations and urbanization is already and will increasingly make it more difficult to provide our citizens with sufficient amount of clear, clean water. To combat this growing challenge, we need to start valuing our water and use our scarce water resources with the respect it deserves. Water stress is increasing in cities around the world. Almost a fourth of the world's population is living in countries where, which are threatened by water sh shortages. The number is expected to increase in the future and the big cities are affected the hardest. I know you already discussed it, but uh, I can repeat that right now the water is about to run out in uh, Chennai, the sixth biggest city in India. Last year, Cape Town in South Africa just barely managed to avoid day zero a scenario where the city would have been all dry. The water stress is also noticeable here in Europe. In 2017, Rome had to ra ration the water, for example. And uh, I remember my visit to La Paz in uh, Bolivia, where, of course, uh, a million, a town with millions of inhabitants is threatened by complete water stress within uh, a few decades. Water stress is uh, different than drought because water stress is caused by humans and hence it's our responsibility to use the water resource in a way to decrease the risk of water stress. When a city uses almost all of its water in the everyday life, it gets extremely vulnerable to droughts and climate change. There are many things society and consumers can do to decrease the water stress. It matters how cities are planned, how water is reused, and how food is produced. Only by decreasing food waste, we can reduce the water stress significant, significantly, since less food is produced in vain. On top of that, a lot more can be done to make food production more efficient, so less water is needed to produce the same amount of food. The challenge of economizing our scarce water resources also has an importance to reach the global targets for sustainable development, Agenda 2030, and to build societies that are prepared for the inevitable changes in climate. Early adoption measures like those ongoing here in Sweden help society avoid more problematic and expensive climate effects later on. Investments in water and sanitation infrastructure and water resource management and urban planning can mitigate the impacts of drought, flooding and the water, risk of waterborne disease. Investing in more climate resilient in infrastructure and urban planning also can provide major economic and employment opportunities. So to conclude, there's a lot that can be done to decrease the water stress that we experience now around the world. Advances in technology and innovation are more widely accessible than ever before. And we possess the knowledge to change our societies. Approaches to building resilience in water systems are increasingly understood and undertaken in urban agriculture and energy systems. And by raising awareness of the ecosystem services that water serve, serve us with, it becomes clear that efforts in sustainable water management is good and often 
necessary investments. Dear friends, water is a necessity of life and a fundamental requirement for development. Securing access to water for all people is one of the major political environmental challenges for the world leaders today. As my colleague Peter Eriksson said in his opening remarks on Monday, this is something that is up to us, decision makers, in politics as well and as in businesses. It's time to step up now. Each and every one of us have a special responsibility. And when we see climate change and water management as two sides of the same coin, we also understand that the unsustainable use of all our planetary systems is completely unacceptable and we need to change that if we're going to live up to the Paris Agreement and if we're going to manage to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Isabella Levin, also Minister in Charge of Environment and Climate. This brings us to an end of uh, this morning's sessions about uh, the future of bring a resilient uh, world. And now, uh, actually, I would like to invite all speakers, uh, Matilde, Fred, uh, Maggie, Patrick, Alejandro, Isabella on stage because there will be a group photo. This is what we're going to do right now. And after that, uh, thanks a lot for attending. I really like this fishbowl con uh, concept, so we will get back to that in the future World Water Weeks, that's for sure. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Jennifer? Yeah, yeah, all speakers. All of those, all speakers. We also have our friend from Finland.